Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited. I got two uh, people on today that I admire very much. When it comes to philanthropy, when it comes to networking, when it comes to entrepreneurship, I can't think of two guys that I, I, I want uh, more. And they happen to be in town at the same time, so I was excited to have them on together because they these guys are really close. Uh, two awesome, awesome gentlemen I'm going inter to uh, interview today. First is Dan Fleischman. He's the youngest founder of a publicly traded company at, in history at the age of 23, the creator of Who's Your Daddy Energy Drinks on in 55,000 retail stores and military bases, the founder of Victory Poker. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And the Elevator Nights and the Model Citizen Fund, which he's been so gracious to let me host. Also, today we have Ryan Stuman, a.k.a. Hardcore Closer. He's a best-selling author, CEO of five companies, founder, of phonesites.com. He's a full-time investor and consultant and million of two millionaires and celebrities across the globe. And I'm so happy to have you guys. Welcome. What's Thanks. up? Glad to be here. Terrific. You guys are here for the Thrive Conference. That's terrific. Uh, I want to ask, first off, how do you guys... Now, I knew both of you independently, and I knew that, uh, Ryan, you were at a bunch of the elevator nights. How do you guys know each other? What's your connection? Uh, you want me to tell it? Sure. So... Um I helped Ed Milet, uh get some PR a few years back in 2018, and Ed Milet had just got onto Instagram, and he hired a PR company that was m my clients at the time, and they reached out to me. Because of that, I ended up getting into this Arte thing, which is a mastermind network with Andy and Ed. It's a, a little different now, but back then there was like maybe 50 of us, and we were like the original people or whatever. So I went to, and I'll never forget this, I went to the very first um, event, it was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, on 9-11, and Rob O'Neill spoke, right? So that's like something that you'll never forget. The guy right. that killed Osama bin Laden speaking his on 9-11. Yeah, his yeah. book, The Operator, is fantastic. Great book, great yeah. book. He's a great guy. He's yeah. hilarious, you know? And um, anyway, I look over in the room, and I see uh, Casey Fleischman, who was just Casey, whatever her name was before that, uh, and Dan sitting over there. And I noticed that they sat next to Andy and Ed and kind of by, like, the, the people that work. So yeah. I was like, okay. And um, they just kind of stood out a little bit. And then, like, we go to dinner, and I noticed that him and Casey sit down next to Ed and Andy. And I didn't know Andy. You know, this was, like, my first introduction Which to him. Which Andy? Uh, Andy Frisella. Got it. Got it. And, and so... Like the next day, I watch and it's like they're doing something, and, and Ed was like pulls the chair out for, and I'm like, those two, there's something to them. So I like slid in. It's like, hey man, what's up? I'm Ryan. Just introduce myself, and I pretty much just latched on to Dan ever since then. I don't, I think we've been on, you know, God, I don't know how many stages and how many events. It's like almost impossible to keep up with at this point, but. Uh, we have done a lot of epic stuff together. Dan has done a lot of epic stuff, and I've been there to be a no part of it. No kidding, man. Yeah. No kidding, Dan. Do you remember all this? I can't top that. That was great. That was great. That was exactly <laughs> how it was. I met you, Dan, from uh, Marcella, yep. uh, who runs who, who runs a Model Citizen Fund yep. and, and other charities that she's worked with uh, for, with Lyme disease and different stuff like that. Marcella told me about you because I was hosting Babes in Toilet, and she was one of the girls yep. I interviewed. And I came and met you. And like the thing is, and I'm sure you'll probably agree with me, when you understand the influence that Dan has and how nice he is, it almost doesn't fit. Right. right? And I, like I, we talked about this when I interviewed uh, DJ Irie. We were, talk, we were talking about this and several other people, just the, the amount of connection. So the thing is, let's talk about Victory Poker because Victory Poker isn't something that exists anymore. But I feel like a lot of everything that exists now started <laughs> there because of the lineup you had in Victory Poker. Can you talk about the lineup, the models and the players that were in Victory Poker and what that was? Sure. So when online poker was hot, I saw a big void in the market. There was no cool po poker site. So I want to make the cool kids. So I put together one of the biggest poker pro teams of all young pros, Antonio Esfandiari and all these type of characters, but then mix them with DJ Steve Aoki, Dan Bilzerian, Sarah Underwood, and all these Playboy Playmates, Jesse Preston and Jessa Hinton and all these girls, combine them all together to make a fun poker site. And just by creating content, remember this is a decade ago, making YouTube content, Twitter content, MySpace, like there was no Instagram back then. We got millions and millions and millions of views doing crazy stuff with Bill Zarian blowing up RVs in the desert or model photo shoots from the UK to Las Vegas at the Hard Rock. And so making that cool kids site was what helped us stand out because we started out with $2.6 million. My competitors, Full Tilt and Poker Stars, they were doing $4 million to $8 million a day in revenue. Wow. So we're the little engine that could with 2 million bucks 
where should these guys doing that in a couple hours? And so that's how it all kind of started. It, it, you almost created like this conglomerate, or like, uh, this conglomerate of influencers that were together before there was Instagram. Right. And so many of those influencers ended up taking off. It's almost like a variety, almost like uh, people who go on Saturday Night Live and then become movie stars. A lot of them started there with Victory Poker. So from our poker pros, most of them are married now. Yeah. So Bilzerian and Jessa were ended up be get, being together for like two or three years yeah. from there. Uh, Keith Gibson married Lacey Jones. Andrew Robo married like the, the squad started marrying the people that we met and they're still married to day, yeah. a decade later from Victory Poker. That's incredible. That was that was an incredible lineup. And Dan talks about Bulgarian talks about you a lot in the book. And I mentioned that before. Dan just said uh, he's known you for 13 years. He wanted to yeah. say what's up. He lives like four blocks or four miles from here. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan, you have been featured in Forbes, Huffington Post, The Entrepreneur. The Street.com, uh, The Good Men Project, and CNBC. What are the things that you, what, what causes you to get on, on these different platforms? You know, um, I guess I've never hired a PR person or anything like that, but I'm, I'm really good at writing. And uh, I have, it's not like something I went to school for or whatever. It's just something that I practiced like an instrument and got good at. So um, I just, it's pretty easy to get that stuff, to be honest with you. It was back when I got it all set up. And uh, I just applied for each of those sites and started writing for them. And they, some of my stuff they would take, some of it they wouldn't. And like, I started what, what, learning. What you, for instance, what are you writing for CNBC? Uh, so I might write a piece on a, a company that, or, or a new marketing technique, oh, okay. or All a right. new sales technique, or uh, something, just like any other. There, so here's the thing that I understand about the, the internet, it still works this way now is all these sites are looking for some story that will get clicks that they can run ads so that they can make money, right? right. So my job is to like catch some kind of news story or something before it gets legs so that I can put it on Forbes, which with their SEO capability can get it to the top of Google before everybody looks at it, Got looks it. for it, right? And so I, <clears throat> I've been doing that for uh, back when Huffington Post, I actually used to like to troll them because they were like a very liberal yeah. publication, and I used to write very conservative pieces on <laughs> okay, there. Okay, all right. Even though I could care less either way, I used to used to think that was funny, you yeah. know what I mean? But I was like the one guy that was the contrarian of yeah. the whole site. And uh, with Entrepreneur, I've written, uh, I've written a bunch of stuff about new marketing uh, technologies and new companies and, and then uh, specifically people that were on the come up that are interesting as well, too. That's awesome. So, that, so you found a niche that other people, because I know you, you saw that they needed that content and you went after that specific type of content. Exactly, because I needed a title. Got it. See, most of my life works like if I can help you get what you want and then, and then you know Michael, then maybe I get a shot to get Michael what he wants so that he can get with Trevor who will get me my stuff. Like that's usually how net working works, yeah, right? Exactly. So I knew that if I gave Forbes what they want, then I could say that I wrote for Forbes and then people would view me as like some sort of importance because I wrote for Forbes because clearly they they trust only professionals, right? right? And so then I get to put myself as in, you know, hey, they don't just let any idiot write for Forbes. So it gave me some authority other than, hey, everybody, here's my GED. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it it helped me in that sense. So I had to figure out a way to get in there. And the average person's like, oh, I'm really cool and I can write stuff. Me, I would actually wrote them stuff. It's like, you guys should publish this. And after a few of them, they're like, hey, you, you should write for us. These are good pieces. And so... Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just hosted both Max and parties, and I, I'm a, on red carpet host. It's exactly the same thing. Like the the credibility comes from what I host, not even from how good I am at my job. But that's yep. incredible. I, I'm definitely going to go check some of those out. That's terrific. Uh, Dan, uh, you had a licensing deal with Starter Apparel um, and creator of the. Now I had a bunch of talking about the same starter with the starter jackets. I had yeah. Dallas Cowboys starter jacket yeah, back yeah. in the '90s. I love that shit. And then uh, the Who Does Your Daddy Energy Drink? Can you talk about uh, this these early entrepreneurial ventures that you had? Yeah, so I trademarked the catchphrase, who's your daddy, for over 300 products back in high school from 17, 18 years old. I was spending all this money trademarking. You were in San Diego at the time, I was right? based in San Diego, yep. And then we got a warehouse in Los Angeles and then ended up with a showroom in New York. And so the clothing was our first thing. Around 19 years old is when I got the deal with Starter Apparel. It was $9.5 million for a three-year deal to license us just for the UK. And so that money helped me go through the entrepreneurial roller coasters of making money, losing money, especially at being 18, 19, 20 years old. People taking advantage of us, like Ryan would say, hey, I'll make you do samples. And he would charge me $36,000 for like 12 samples when it should have been $3,000. So we were getting screwed left and right. The money coming in from that helped us go through that entrepreneurial roller coaster. Then when I was 23 is when I took it public to launch the energy drink. And so that using that money, that press, everything that happened in that moment is how I was able to fund the energy drink. And similar to the poker side, I saw a void. There was 900 drinks on the market, yeah. but they all tasted like cough syrup. They all had yeah, that, they do. that thick things to it. So yeah. I was like, what am I going to do to fix this? So I thought about what's my favorite drink? Gatorade. 
I'm going to go find the chemist from Gatorade. I'm going to go find someone that helped make Gatorade. I did. I found this guy. He's like 71 years old. Happened to be in Orange County. Go meet with him. And so we ended up getting the flavoring from him, a cranberry pineapple drink that was zero sugar, zero carbs, zero calories. Mm. Completely unheard of back in the yeah. energy drink days. And he said, if you do well with this, when you do over a million bucks in sales, then I'll give you the green tea. Okay. You'll be the first green tea energy drink ever. Red Bull turned me down for cranberry pineapple, and they turned me down for green tea. They just want to stick to their yeah. flavor. So we got lucky, right? Cough, cough syrup medicine. <laughs> right. The flavor the, of Red Bull. Yeah. The main thing was just turn down the main ingredient that had that, that thick taste yeah, to yeah. it and then add in a different uh, ingredient. Anyways. And so... We won really big on the flavors. Yeah. And out of the 900 drinks, we were on the cover of the beverage magazine as flavor of the year. That set us off. Right now, I could walk into any store, any distributor, anywhere and just say, look, I'm flavor of the year. How are you going to say no? Yeah. Right? right. And so I went and got the first Budweiser distributor in Utah, or sorry, in Orange County, who then set me up with Utah. We got all nine Budweiser distributors throughout Utah. Then we got Arizona. And then once I had those, and I had Smith's Grocery Store and Ralph's and Southern Wine and Spirits here in Las Vegas. And I started getting nightclubs and restaurants. All I would do is walk in and be like, hey, Ryan, I'm already, hold on, I'm, in about two hours, I'm going to go meet with 7-Eleven. But today, this morning, I was meeting with Budweiser, and I just wanted to go over all the drinks that we have for you. How could he say no? Right. I just said, I mentioned his competitor, right? I mentioned right. I have Budweiser, my distributor. I wasn't asking for a sale. I'm explaining what he's going to order. Yeah. I'm never asking for a sale. Yeah. Yeah. Red Bull and Monster range from three to four dollars a can. We're only two dollars a can. But your actual profit margin is actually 62% with us. You're only 48% with them. And so I'm just explaining how they're going to buy it and why they're going to buy it. And I never asked. And so that's how we got into 43 distributors and 55,000 retail stores is I would go get the distributors. At the same time, I'd meet the distributor. I'd also meet with the chain stores. Yeah. And everybody liked it. It's incredible. So uh, just listening to you, the explanation of an entrepreneurial mindset, you're explaining to them their profit margin. You're not even asking. You're telling them, we're going to get to objections later. I feel like he's handling objections before they even get there. That's really awesome. That's because, the best way to do it. Yeah, but the, because the two of you are experts in sales, and that's one thing that I definitely want to talk about and recommend to other people. So that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, Ryan. Hey, uh, hang on. I just yeah, want to ahead. point out that <clears throat> Dan has had people following influencers before they could do it on the gram. Like, these people just showed up at the poker tournaments, sometimes to play poker, but mostly to watch the wild shit that these people were getting into, I would imagine, right? Like, yeah. before you could see Instagram stories, you had to join the poker tournament to see what Bilzerian was up to or Aoki yeah, was up to. I legitimately think Instagram would not look the way it does now if it was not for Victory Poker. I know that sounds like right. a hyperbole, but I seriously, if you look at some of the major influencers in the beginning, yeah, so many of them were connected to each other because of Victory I, Poker. I was literally installing Instagram on these on a lot of household names, people's phones. Like yeah. I would say, hey, I know you like Twitter a lot, but you got to see Instagram. Yeah. Like, physically taking like household name musicians, household yeah. names, celebrities, and influencers. I was forcefully installing Instagram because I felt like it was the right one and then when I started paying Kylie Jenner Kim Kardashian all these characters like six figures to post about things then all of a sudden people are like wait a minute I can make money from this stuff yeah nobody's getting paid for MySpace and Twitter and YouTube yeah. but now with Instagram I'm physically showing them look I'm paying Amber Rose twenty thousand dollars to, to post about fit tea I'm paying this one of these Kardashians a quarter million a hundred thousand two hundred thousand to post about fashion Nova and fit tea and sugar bear hair and these different different type of brands now Thousands of influencers started popping up like, wait a minute. She's posting to post a, about a dress, yeah. about a tea or about a vitamin. I'll, I'll do that. And so now we're, we're paying now 3,500 influencers a year on average just because they're finally realizing they can post about what they already wear yeah. or use or like. You're paying them through which apparatus? Elevator Studio. Okay, got so it. So that's my main. So I spend 60 million bucks on average paying okay. influencers for brands, products, and mobile apps. But it all started from back then, the Victory Poker Days. That's a TikTok right there. I'm paying 60 million to influencers. 100%. Yep. I'm putting that on TikTok. That's beautiful, man. Uh, did you grow up in Dallas? Yes. Okay. It so at the age of 21, you're incarcerated for selling drugs. Shout out. You know, I was <laughs> at the same out. time. Shout out. Uh, hey, I was, if anybody I, in America knows the metric system, yeah. it's not from school. It's from, it's they're from, definitely it's a reformed it's drug from, dealer. It's from pushing weight in Dallas. Yeah. So I, I grew up in Dallas, very familiar. Uh, I didn't sell drugs, but I, I grew up in the ghetto. I went to high school in a really bad neighborhood. I had a lot of friends that were drug dealers back then. Uh, so this is something I'm a little familiar with. Uh, getting out of prison, uh, turn your life around, seven figures, start selling real estate. What Can you talk about this at 21? Where, where were you, by the way? Where in Dallas were you? So um, I lived off Skillman and Audelia. So you were near Wood, Woodrow Wilson too, but you were in yeah. Brian Adams. Is that what high school you were at? Man, I did not go to high school. Really? I left school in the eighth grade. I went, my parents moved to the suburbs in the ninth grade, and I attended like the first semester of the ninth grade in this small town called Allen. Yeah, of course. And then I bolted. 
And back then, Allen's kind of a big town now, but oh, back look, then you, it made you were like, selling drugs in East Dallas. How did we not meet? I don't understand. <laughs> That's crazy, How man. Are you? I'm 44. Yeah, shit. You're, so my wife's best friend's husband, who's a really good friend of mine, yeah. too, literally lived in the apartment complex that shared the wall with mine. He's the exact same age yeah. and everything. I never fucking met him. Dude. Until you know, until we were forty years old, which is probably a good. I went thing, to high you know? school with your plug. I almost yes, guarantee, guarantee you, I did. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. for sure, because he was about two years older than. Yeah, me. <clears throat> that's crazy. That's crazy. So that whole thing, what what got you into it, and then what got you out of it? Well, I uh, I worked at a car wash, and I was the guy that sold car washes. So like when you come in, yeah. you want ten dollar wash. And this guy one day asked me. He, I asked him what he did for a living. He was always had like nice cars and yeah. jewelry. I thought he was a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And he's like, "You smoke weed?" And I was like. Yeah. And this is in the 90s. So that was very taboo back then. Right. And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, well, hit me up tonight. It was New Year's Eve. He said, hit me up tonight and uh, you can buy some of my weed and you'll see how I get this money. I'm like, all right. That's interesting. You know. And so I hit him up that night to get some weed. And I'm like, hey, man, I need like a lot. And he's like, what do you need? It's like, like an ounce. <laughs> right. Like that seemed like a lot to me at the time. And anyway, I go to his house. There's a bunch of people there, and he's counting up money and shit. And I was like, man, this looks like it pays a lot better than this car wash. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> a lot of downsides like going to prison. Prison they, they is a downside. Yeah, it. yeah, for sure. I, I tried, I moved from weed to coke, tried coke one time in my whole life, and I overdosed on the shit. Oh, no. And I don't know if I overdosed or I had an adverse reaction, whatever. It ain't for me. And uh, but because of that, the chick I was with ran in, called the police. I was with prostitutes. Coke and hose go together. Yeah, That's they just do. How they're supposed to. It's, it's like a mathematical. Yeah, equation. Absolutely, it's like peanuts and M and M's. You yeah. know. And um, so she called nine one one, and literally just across the street was the fire department. Like not even a quarter mile. Like Wait, maybe is this on Skillman or Abrams? Where, where is this? this? At this time, I'm eighteen, so I'm back living in Plano. At okay, this time. Plano. So, okay. So grew up in Dallas, and then by the time I had left school and shit, I moved into the suburbs yeah. and stuff like that. Um, the competition selling drugs over there was like very thick, not so much in the suburbs, yeah. right? Like Plano and Allen sure. didn't have the same context as Skillman and Audelia. And so anyway, fire department brought me back to life. Long story short, wake up in the hospital and go to court a year or two later. They end up giving me two years in prison. But my lawyer told me that it would be like, oh, man, you're going to do 90 days. Two years like in that. prison for the possession of the for marijuana? The for, uh, for dealing coke. For dealing coke. Got it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. But it was powder. Yes. That's how yes. you got two years. Because yep. you know in the state of Texas, if it's crack, I mean, it's way they, more than two years. They changed that now, but back then, yeah. hell yes. 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 They, uh, George Bush actually on his way out of office changed that law uh, federally. I was actually in prison when they let them all go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I went back. So I, mean, I, went that, I mean, the, the, the thought was that discriminated against yes, African Americans. African Americans. Yep. Exclusively selling crack cocaine and not powdered cocaine. Because it carried 10 times the, yeah. the amount of time. And so it's like, and it's majority black folks that, that were uh, convicted of that. So it became this racist deal. And, yeah. And Obama took a lot of credit for it. But I was in prison when Bush signed that because I watched everybody going yeah, home. Yeah, for sure. You know? So. Uh, anyway, lawyer tells me I'm going to do four or five months, good behavior, I'll be out. That turned out to be a lie. I did like 18 or 19 months on a 24-month sentence. I went to eight, six or eight different fucking prisons. So it was like I had to, it wasn't just one place that I got to stay. I went on this whole royal <laughs> tour of bullshit. This was a state <clears throat> only, though. Yes. Right, not federal. Okay. Got out, got my shit together, went back to the car wash, because car wash is higher felons. Yep. Went back to the car wash, worked my ass off at this job. And one day, the customer, there was a regular customer, she said, you're always selling me a car wash. You do a good job on my car. I want to give you a job. So what you got? She said, uh, I work in mortgages. What's that mean? Right. I have, like, literally <laughs> no idea. <clears throat> Never heard that word in my life. And she's like, like, home loans. And I was like, oh, I don't know nothing about loans. I, I own that truck over there for cash. I yeah. pay cash for my apartment. She goes, I can teach you. And I'm, like, giving her objections, you know. And I'm like... Well, and I'm a convicted felon and I'm a convicted felon, you know, and she's like, oh, for what? And I was like, I got caught selling drugs. She's like, ah, hell, probably you'll be fine. You might even meet some new customers in the office. Sounds right? like, like a good salesman to me, yeah. you know? So I quit my job. She said this, as long as, hey, I tell you what, they took you back after prison. Surely they'll take you back after the bank. Come work for me. If it doesn't work out, I'll come get your job back at the car wash. So I go take this job within... Say three weeks of taking the job, I made like almost ten thousand dollars. All right, Whoa. I just got stumbled into a deal. Then about two weeks later, I made another like fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars. So I used to work all year long to make thirty grand, and now I did it in like you know two months. 
So I went all in, dude. I bought a bunch of this was the subprime days. Bought a bunch of houses, bunch of rent properties. I owned 32 houses by the time I was 25 years old. And <clears throat> the cops raided my main house. They thought I was selling dope again. I was working from home. I knew how to hack into the uh, bank server. Yeah. So I would just work from home and do the applications there. <clears throat> this uh, desert air is killing my uh, voice. But I worked from home, but I would have people from the houses paying rent. So the first of the month, people from the houses coming by, real estate agents coming by, property managers coming by. So I had a busy ass house. And one minute it might be somebody in an old beat up you know, car that is one of my hood houses that they're renting. And then there might be a realtor come by in a bins five minutes later. Yeah. So I get how the cops probably thought I was selling drugs. Well, well, are you in Plano at this time? Uh, back in Allen. Okay. And so, but when they kicked the door in, I didn't have so much as even a sandwich bag. Yeah. But I had guns. Okay. And so in Texas, you can have guns if you're a felon. You can have lots of guns. You can have whatever you want. Yeah. But there's some federal rules that, that expired now, but back then existed under Joe Biden, of all people, and Clinton back in those days. Um, not Obama and Biden, but uh, back, way back in the Clinton days. And they had passed some kind of law that was you, you couldn't have so many rounds in a clip or some shit under the Brady Bill, if you remember right. that stuff. I do right? remember. I think it's 20 or 30 rounds in an uh, assault rifle it's, clip. It's all yeah. expired now, yeah. right? And uh, But anyway, back then, so they found some loophole. So I beat the state, and then I was going to sue the, the city for fucking embarrassing yeah. me and dragging me through the mud. I didn't know that their retaliation would be to turn me over to the feds who like then stuck that other crime on me, which they, they end up charging me with international transport of a firearm. Are we talking, are we I talking about the home. ATF raid yes. that happened later? So the, 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 you ended up, after you get out of prison, the, the local DPD in, in comes out. I'm sorry, I guess Allen Police Department. Yeah, Allen, yep. They come and they invade you. You embarrass them because you, the, you beat the rap. Yep. And then they turn it over to the feds so that yep. now the ATF then raids you. Is that they correct? don't raid me. They just call me one day and they say, hey, man, we need you to come down here and talk to us. Yeah. I'm like, man, I'm kind of praying. I had just started this new job and they and they were like, we need you to come to the Bank of America building. I was like, man, some bullshit. I'm not working at Bank of America. I took a job over at this other mortgage company and they're like, we're serious, Mr. Stuman. So I showed up, and sure enough, you know, and, and they never cuffed me or anything. They took me in there. They gave me a drug test, and I passed the drug test, so they let me out on my own reconnaissance. So, like, I didn't do a night in jail or anything you, like were that. Were you still on probation? Is that why they had mm -hmm. doing a drug I test? I have been off for five or six years. Okay. And But they were saying, hey, if you pass the drug test, you can go home. If not, it's going to be a long fucking ride for him. Like, well, I didn't know I was going to get arrested. What the hell does that have to do with anything? But I didn't have any drugs anyway, yeah. you know, but can imagine it's like i didn't know that was going to be a prerequisite or getting out or i'd have walked around clean but That's i just crazy. have to walk around clean anyway so i go back they tell me they're gonna give me 20 years i get my lawyer elected as district attorney of dallas county right it's a whole other fucking story <laughs> my life's pretty damn interesting well, who, who, who's, who's this his, his name is craig watkins he okay. was the first uh ever african-american uh elected uh what do you call it? judicial official in all of Dallas County? They never right. had a black judge, a black DA, or we, any of that. We, we need to talk about Dallas when we get a chance. Go yeah. ahead, yeah. And uh, and he was the first Democrat to ever be in the judiciary system there, which now is largely Democratic, which is it's flipped since then. Sorry, and um, but he pulled some strings and got my time reduced to fifteen months. I end up going to federal prison. For 15 months, lost everything. 2008. But hold on, a federal person, just so people know, you do day for day. There's no yeah. get out early on parole when you when That's you it. when you get convicted of a federal crime. Yeah, and they and they do it in months, not years. Yeah. And so, uh, so now I'm federal property. I go live in a federal prison, and federal prison is a lot different than state. We had our own movie theater, just to put it in perspective. Our own little field house yeah. and shit. It's very just, nice. Yeah. Again, just so people understand, a lot of minimum security federal prisons are actually on military bases. So that's like, what this for, was. So Maxwell Air Force Base is a, is a minimum security prison, and it's a it's a U.S. Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot, but all the lawn, the gardening, all that kind of stuff is yep. handled by the prisoners. Go ahead. Yep. yep. You're exactly right, and that's what uh, that's what we did. I was in one that was behind the fence, but it was a minimal security that used to be at a a, a base that was taken over now. It's just a prison and 15 months there. But this is where the story gets cool. So two days or two weeks after I walk into this prison, I'm waiting in line to eat breakfast. And in front of me are these two Hispanic guys that I used to sell drugs with when I was like a teenager that yeah. I got caught with the first time. But I didn't snitch on anybody. Yeah. And I got no case and I never told on anybody back then. I got integrity or whatever the hell you want to call it. Right. right? And I tap him on the shoulder. I'm like, hey, yo, Angel, remember me? And he's like. Uh, no. And I was like, it's me, Breeze. I was like, my name. And he's like, hey, I thought you cleaned up. You were like a banker or some shit. He's like, me too. You're not going to believe this fucking story. Um, but here I am for 15 months, right? He goes, you're a banker now? I told him, he goes, I'm going to send somebody to talk to you. 
So, you know, I go back after we eat breakfast. I go back to my cell. Some big, huge Mexican dude with, like, teardrops down to his ankle, like, just <laughs> covered in tattoos, comes, and he's like, which one of you guys is stewing? And my cellmate's like, it ain't me. It's like, well, fuck, there's only two of us. So I go upstairs with this guy. They're living in a different world upstairs. They yeah. got Rolexes on. They're smoking weed. There's, like, everything but chicks up there, right? Yeah. And... And where I was living was for the last couple of weeks was totally different. But there were these gang leaders up there, these Hispanic gang leaders. And they were like, hey, man, we're trying to clean up our drug money so that when we get out of here in five or six years, we have actual real assets. Yeah. The dude said that, you know, about real estate and you used to be a banker. You think you could help us? And I'm like, well, fuck what they going to do, put us in jail. You know what I mean? Like, we're already fucking here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I did not I, think this podcast was going to go in this direction. All right, let's talk about this money laundering. I am definitely anti-rape. So if we yeah. can keep that on hold and, yeah. and I can get in good with the, because federal, pri like state prisons, majority black. Yeah. Federal prisons, majority Hispanic, because a lot of them are there on immigration holds. Got it. And so, and so the majority of this place is Hispanic, man. There's 2,000 people. 50 of us are white. 50 of them are black. The rest of them are Hispanic, yeah. right, where we're at. And so it's really good to be in with those guys. So, dude, I start doing seminars in the, library, in the law library on Wednesday. And so the first night, it's like the Tongo Blast guys, and then it's the Mexican Mafia the next Hold week. On. Have you ever heard this story before? Oh. You did not know that he was <laughs> telling people about laundering money in federal prison. Keep going, Ryan. That's where this whole – That's now I'm speaking on stage. Hell yes, I'm man. not teaching money laundering. I'm teaching money making. But in prison, you got you to do what Bro, you got to do. Listen, you know is that it, your it, first speech? Yes, that's how I became a fucking motivational speaker that incredible? in prison. Dude, my first speech – God's I, plan's always better than our a, own. I was a DJ at a strip club, and that's how I ended up <laughs> doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's unbelievable. So that's what you were doing, doing that before. So I, so I mean, just a real quick overview. Dallas to me is still the most segregated city in America. You are North of 30. There is one lifestyle. You are South of 30. It's a different lifestyle. Um, I lived you are right. Correct. It is night and fucking yes. day. I, I lived in Atlanta. I've been to I St. Louis. I never thought of it that way. I but never, it is. I never. I lived in Atlanta. I lived, uh, been to St. Louis. All these other cities. Dallas is the most segregated city in America. And um, like what you said before, we had a uh, one district attorney. Uh, all those you remember all those cases that were overturned. He put people on death row with no evidence. Yep. Had fa face, faked a bunch of evidence. They were all African American. My lawyer's the one that overturned them all. It was okay. the guy previous to him that go. was doing that shit. Yes. There you go. Yeah. And after he passed away, they went and reviewed yep. a bunch of his cases. Had a bunch of death sentences overturned. Uh, when you are when you are north of Swiss Avenue, you have expensive land. You were Lakewood stuff like mm -hmm. that in East Dallas. When you are south of Swiss Avenue, when you're down there by Samuel Grand and all that kind of stuff, there are some crack dealers. There were so many drug dealers in my high school. I didn't know who they were selling drugs to. They were all just, there was no one to sell drugs to. Yeah. They were all dealers. <laughs> I remember when I used to play Madden uh, semi pro, like the video game Madden, and I would get invited to go to people's house. This is before there was online tournaments, and I was sitting in this dude's house. Everybody's got braids. There's these weird smells in the air. It's, I mean, we're out there like fit you and 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 uh, like in the ghetto, man. Yeah, out there by uh, MLK uh, by uh, Malcolm X. Yep. And um, and I'm sitting there. My best friend at the time, and I'm probably gonna have him here on the podcast at some point. He he's he's looking at me, and I'm whooping this dude's ass. And he looks at me, and he's like, no. <laughs> He's like, no. And I did lose I, Mike. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 17. I don't know that I'm playing with tr like heavy trappers, like big time drug dealers. And I'm beating the shit out of them. These guys are like betting on me to beat them at Madden, taking money. I'm like, he's like, no, you do not want to beat this guy. <laughs> and I, li I was like literally giving up games. And then later on, like I find out like a bunch of these guys end up going to jail for, for, for distribution for crack. Like you said, 35 yep. years is what some, a bunch of guys I went to high school with got 35 years. Woodrow Wilson was his, mostly Hispanic. We had maybe like a, 78% dropout rate. I mean, it was really bad wow. back then. So it's it just really interesting when you hear that because that was like an or that was a very defining point of my life where I was like, I don't want this. You know what I'm saying? My brother started selling drugs. Like it was just a very, very different intro. So when you talk about selling drugs in East Dallas, that was something that just yeah. I reminded, you know, 91 to 95 was a crack epidemic. And Dallas was a very, di very dangerous, very different place back then. So, yeah. And up in the suburbs, the heroin. There oh, was, my God. That yes. shit? Yeah, yeah, up yeah. in Plano and all that stuff, dude. That was a really big deal. You know, looking back, I'm fortunate that I only got the time that I did, even yeah. though I didn't have a whole lot of drugs. But they could have made examples out of people back then. You, you know? should you should read the book called The Arrangement. Uh, and it actually is about the segregation of Dallas in the 1960s. It's a pr pretty, pretty good book. Um, and then let's talk about this, man. Um, so you were, we talked about wrongfully accused by the police, the ATF thing. You got out of that. So how, how, how did you settle that thing with the ATF? Yeah. So they give me 15 months. I go to, I go to prison. I go to prison. I'm married and I'm, I'm a millionaire. I, uh, within a few months of seminars, my wife leaves me for a guy that owns a landscape company that mowed all the yards. She sells all my houses. I leave 15 months later with like 25 bucks to my name. Wow. 
broke, no house, no oh, so nothing. Because you're a convicted felon, you don't get half? You, she can just <laughs> sell your property? How does it work? Well, uh, she wrote me a letter that's like, you can deal with all this when you're going to get out, but if I don't have any money when I get out, how am I going to hire a lawyer? Got and, it. You know what I mean? It's like, and she's like, you know, I'll, if you don't contest this, and she sent me divorce papers, if you don't, and I, we didn't have a bad relationship, yeah. so it was just like, phew, I don't know. She said, if you don't contest this, uh, and you sign these papers, I'll leave your clothes behind. If not, I'll throw them away. You know, it's like, shit, you already throw, you know what? She didn't throw away my clothes or my books. There you go. You know why she didn't throw away my books? Because she doesn't read? Because dumb people don't read. Hell yeah. Right? That's what I found the same thing. Because anybody with any damn sense wouldn't have left a felon, that a guy that was wrongly convicted, that only had a year in prison to do, that had already become a millionaire at 25, an idiot doesn't screw that up. I mean, yeah. a smart person doesn't screw that up, you know, but anyway. So get out, got nothing. I go back into the mortgage business, but it's probably the worst time in the world to be in the mortgage business because it was the crash of so 2008. So crash of 08. Got it. All right, now I understand the time but, timeline. But I had a, an angle. Every time people would leave the industry, like let's say that you're quitting. It's like, man, fuck it, I quit. I can't do this industry anymore. It's driving me crazy. I'd be like, who's going to take care of your customers? So I started calling all my old friends that, that were loan officers before I went to prison that are now no longer uh, loan officers that are doing roofing or insurance, and I would ask them for their customers. So in 2008, 2009, when the world was crashing, I was making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, you know. Uh, but in 2010, government interfered again with my life, and uh, Obama and Biden passed a law called the Dodd Frank Act. And part of that said, if you are a convicted felon, you can no longer have a license to loan money for homeowners. Like the uh, national mortgage system was right. enabled and I couldn't get the state no longer offered licenses and the feds wouldn't give me a fucking license. And so that's crazy. I, here yeah. we are. I had yeah. to figure out something. So I turned to the Internet because you didn't need a license. You didn't need a record and you didn't need a boss. There you and go. So that's how it started. Well, me and Dan, our house is about to get raided here in a little bit <laughs> from, uh, from this conversation. Dan, let, Dan, let's talk about how we connected so many people. Now, I cannot express for those of you who are watching this because you don't know because Dan, you, young Jeezy used to say, I'm your favorite rapper's favorite rapper. Yeah. Uh, Dan Fleischman is your favorite influencer's favorite influencer. For and, sure. And, and a lot of you don't know because a lot of the connections that you see, if you understood, they actually, a lot of them start from Dan, especially when it comes to things like cryptocurrency, when it comes to any of these things that you see online, influencers, stuff like that. Dan, can you talk about elevator nights? There's different flavors of elevator nights and exactly what that is. Yeah. So we're throwing our 43rd elevator night tomorrow, actually, at the MGM Grand. Um, so what's interesting is it first started, I had a like a jewelry and electronics and gadget store in downtown San Diego uh, next to the baseball stadium. And upstairs, there was like a little area up there and I had my very first elevator night there. Back then. It was a different name back then. And I thought I was gonna get 40 people. And the 40 people were just like local football players, local business guys, car dealership owners, etc. But then they all started calling like, hey, can I bring my friend? He has a VC. I'm like, what's a VC? He's like, hey, can I call my friend that's this? Can I call... And so there wasn't text messaging back then. And so we just like loaded up this event. So from 40 people, it ended up being like 160. So I was like, hey, I'm going to do this again next month. And the next month was the same thing. I had a couple hundred people. And so I've just been doing these events for free. There, there's no tickets, no sponsors, no sales on stage. Just free, free, free. And so I've been doing it usually around four times a year. Right now I'm doing three in the next 12 days. And so now it's like I'm, I'm scaling and I'm doing it like an NBA arena in Salt Lake City, I'm doing it at Caesars Palace in a couple of weeks. Like I'm doing them at scale now. Uh, but it's just my excuse to get 300 to 1,000 people in the room that are all entrepreneurs. It's my excuse to call all my rich friends to show up and meet my entrepreneurs. And I've done different versions. About 30 of them out of the 43, there's pitches on stage. Yes. Right? Where there's 12 companies. They get five minutes each to pitch to all my rich friends. I don't take anything for it. You guys connect directly. It's nothing mm -hmm. to do with me. I just, out of 300 people that apply, I pick 12. So you know only the top couple percent are going to make it up onto the stage. From there, over 50% of them got funded. And so it got to be really interesting. I was doing this four, five, six times a year and getting a dozen, two dozen companies a year getting funded. I wasn't taking anything for it, but it, I got to cherry pick. And I got to have this like emotional brownie points with people like, hey, Michael invested with Ryan. And then they go off and do all these deals together. They connected back to me emotionally. To, to give a specific example, uh, the crypto elevator nights, I remember Monero was actually giving a speech yeah. up there. And I, I later invested in that because of because of what you did there. So it, you might have a crypto elevator nights and yeah. diff, different things just like that. Yeah. So in 2014, I installed the very first Bitcoin ATM okay. right here at the D Hotel. 
very first. Imagine explaining to the state of Nevada <laughs> politicians for six months a Bitcoin ATM. Try that now, let alone 2014. Looked at me like I had three heads. But we got it in there into the D Hotel, which was really fun back then. 2017, I started throwing the crypto events. So I was throwing them at the W Hotel in Hollywood. I threw them in Hubble Studio, different places. And I'm there screaming about Ethereum. Like I'm telling you guys got to look at Ethereum. It's really interesting. It's $19. You guys should really look into it. I did that Facebook post that went viral. It's in Forbes and Inc. and everywhere about me saying, hey, Ethereum's 19 bucks. They just signed this thing called the Ethereum Alliance. By the way, Ethereum's like almost $4,000 now. So it's a yeah. 200 to one upswing. So I'm explaining to people at this crypto event about Ethereum, about Bitcoin, et cetera. And then sometimes I would bring up different coins like founders like Monero, where I'll bring in the founder to explain why their coin is valuable or why it's interesting. And I would only allow people to speak that actually had some, some technical knowledge. Yes. Like Monero, I, I believe the advantage was some, uh, some secrecy, some privacy that had Correct. to do with the, Monero. Technically like the privacy coin, yes. Got it. And so now that guy's a multi-bazillionaire. Yeah. And, um, and it was interesting back then, 2017, 2018, throwing these events because people had no idea what Bitcoin was. And right. you know, you'd hear about it, but you didn't understand it. And, and just now, really this last year, is when crypto became mainstream, if you will. Yeah. Where now like major hedge funds and major VCs, major corporations are starting to buy it. But it all, it all stemmed from us screaming from the mountaintops about why people should do it. It didn't do anything for me, right? If you bought Ethereum at 19 yeah. bucks, I don't make anything from it. If you bought Bitcoin when it was 800 bucks, didn't do anything for me. I just wanted people to do it because I believe in what it was. Yeah. Right? I still believe in what it was. I still buy it now. I bought it when it was 19 bucks. I bought it this week when it was 4,000. I still want to buy it. I still right. like it. And so for me, it's a passion thing. I, I believe in what cryptocurrency can do. I believe what the blockchain can do. Like we would never have a voting issue if we was voting on the blockchain. I made this exact point. It's impossible. I said, uh, not, only, not only would we never have a, a, a voting issue, if you want to know if your politician is corrupt, listen to them object to a blockchain voting system. Right. It is irrefutable that that would fix all the, all not some of the problems, right. all of the problems right. when it comes to voter suppression, 100% of the problems would be solved. And, and we get to go to sleep earlier because it'd be done at 7 p.m. If the voting ends at seven, it'd be done at seven. Yeah. Seven, not 701, not 702, at seven. Yeah. That's it. It's all perfect. Yeah. There, it's nothing. We would, take the, we would take so much drama mm -hmm. out of the voting process if we use blockchain. I agree. Right. But that's how a lot of politicians win is through drama. So. Yeah. Um, but I, so I just believe in cryptocurrency. I believe in the blockchain. And I believe in certain coins. As I look at them as investments like a traditional company. Right. And so some coins I'm going deeper on. But for the most part, I'm just trying to get people in. Right. And when, I, when I'm speaking at events, I'm like, just buy 20 bucks of Bitcoin. But go on yep. Cash App, go on Square, go on Coinbase. Just got, get 50 bucks, 100 bucks of Ethereum and Bitcoin. Just taste it. Just try it. Just have it. And then when you feel more comfortable, buy 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. I just want people to be in the game because over the course of time, what people don't realize about Bitcoin, it's not that there's going to be more and more supply. People think, oh, we're going to have 21 million coins. No, we're not. There's 4.6 million Bitcoin that are already missing. Yeah. Every month forever, more Bitcoin will be missing because people are going to die. People use their wallet. Right. People are going to lose it. People, right. I'm going to send you 80 bucks. You're going to spend 60 of it and keep 20 on your wallet and never use that 20. That doesn't matter, right? Oh, it's only 20 bucks on Ryan's wallet. What if 100,000 people a day do that? Yeah. Forever. Yep. 20 bucks here, 20 bucks here, times 100,000. I mean, just to be fair, there is probably US, way more than that. There's billions of dollars of U.S. currency that's also missing. Of yeah. course, and it's yeah. never coming back. Yeah. Whether it's buried, it's in people's houses. It's in, or it's, it's, it's in, <laughs> Pablo right. Escobar has it, yeah. Exactly. And so I just believe in, in these things, and that's why Elevator Nights is something I'm passionate about. Some of them are about cryptocurrency. I've done cannabis elevator nights three times. Yes. I've done fashion elevator nights. I did a music elevator night. But for the most part, I do traditional business elevator nights where I'm going to interview Ryan Stuman and Aaron Wagner. and Kent. You know, like I'm going to invite people that are in town, and I'll try to piggyback off of events. That way, I know a big crowd's already in town, and I'm just going to throw this big, fun, free event. If you've, ever, if you've ever read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, he talks about the mastermind. Yep. idea and i i see you guys specifically using that mastermind idea to the fullest like not a figurative a literal mastermind and that's what i feel like you kind of get with elevator nights is some of the the people uh that you meet there can you talk about some of the your starting lineup can you talk about some ty you know ty lopez can you talk about the, those guys the col the the other guys that come up yeah in so there? both brian and i both have actual paid masterminds yeah so elevator nights is free and then I have what's called the $100 million mastermind. That's $100,000 per person. Okay. So we sold out 100 spots to that. I have a different one with Ryan called the Avengers Real Estate Mastermind. That's $30,000. That's 100 people as well. 
Ryan has the million dollar mastermind. He has these large scale events that have over a thousand people at them, different levels. He has the apex group where people actually pay monthly. Ryan has all tiers. So we have free events, a couple hundred dollar a month events, 10K, 30K for the year, $100,000 for the year. There's levels to, to every aspect of it. But why it's important is what happens in a mastermind. Yep. The other people in the room, let's say you paid $100,000 to come into the mastermind. Yeah. You know everybody else paid 100K to be there. So yeah. you've already, you know who's in the room. If you paid 30K to go to a real estate mastermind, you know everybody there likes real estate enough to pay 30K to be in the room. And so when you go to these business events, whether it's 100 bucks, 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, Everyone in the room vetted themselves. Yeah. So it's not just about the people on the stage. It's yeah. the people in the room that you're going to have a real network with. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, who, who are some of the guys that are involved? I saw your lineup for like Elevator Nights coming up. Can you talk about some of the speakers that you have? Yeah. Um, Ryan Stuman, uh, Aaron Wagner, who yes. owns over 100 restaurants, and both of us invest in all his restaurants. Yeah. And to that Ever Bowl, we have a bunch of Ever Bowls with him. Um, Cole Hatter. Cole, a, yes. Cole's actually the one that throws the Thrive Conference. He's got a, 800 people there today. Um, Kent Clothe. Uh, him and his family managed 7,000 single-family homes. Uh, the Clever Investor, he flips thousands of properties. He's got millions of followers on social. There's just a lot of interesting characters at these events. Ed Milet. Yeah, Ed, Ed Milet. Milet. He won't be at this one this weekend, but Ed Milet for sure. And then Ty Lopez. I, I'm buddies with Ty par partially because of, of your program. Yep. Yeah. So Ty is the one that made this industry the most famous. Yeah. Right? Him and Grant Cardone are kind of the two pioneers of this. Both very polarizing characters. Half the people hate them, half the people love them, yeah. which happens in everything, whether you're Trump or you're Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Half the people hate you, half the people love you, and that's why you're so famous. Um, but Ty and Grant are kind of those, the key, the key people in this space that have spent millions and millions of dollars to make themselves famous. Ty was the first person I ever saw put 200 stories on in one day. Remember when IG Story first wow. started? He put in it, like he cut a 15 a minute. Webinar. Uh, it, a webinar? Basically a webinar in 15 second clips. And I was like two, I, I counted over 200 in one. I've done 100. Uh, when I do Babies in Toyland, I'll get 100 clips in one right. day. For 200, I was like, wow. man, I was watching this whole webinar. I was like, what a crazy, there's no IGTV at this point. Yeah. And I was like, what a crazy idea. He was pushing the limits to some of this stuff. And I've become friends with Ty. I don't, I don't, well, you know, I'm not involved in all of his business stuff. I go to his house sometimes to play basketball because I, you know, I like, Ty's a big basketball fan. But yeah, I mean, it is really interesting. Some of these guys are polarizing. But you know what? The guys who didn't buy your product or didn't pay you a million dollars, who gives a fuck? It's the guys who do, do come and do that. Those are the ones who, who end up you know, end up making money. The, making money because 36,000 36, people paid $1,000 each for, yeah. for the SMMA program. Yeah. That's $36 million on an e, on e product that he's barely in it. Yeah. He just put me for four hours and that guy for two hours and that guy for three hours and that guy for four hours. It was genius. But also, he's got the number one most watched commercial on YouTube history. Yes. 1.4 billion minutes watched. Yes. No. You, you take means. your phone like this and you put the Lamborghini behind yeah, you. Yeah, everybody you go, knows it. Here you, in hey, my listen, garage. you know what you need in your garage? garage? You need knowledge. Right. You know, I went around his house yep. during your birthday party. Or it was the, uh, you remember the, the uh, where we all dressed up in um, the pajamas? Party? Yeah, the pajama, the pajama, pajama party. party. I went yeah. around his house. I was like, you know what you need in this bathroom? You need knowledge. Yeah. I walked out to all these models behind me. You see this right here? This, see this kitchen? It's filled with knowledge. Yeah. He spent a ton of money getting yeah. that, That's that incredible. simple video in front of everybody. I think it's at 97 million views or something like that right now. Maybe more than that. But if you go on there, 1.4 billion minutes. It's incredible. Incredible, yeah, about that thing. Yeah. And it, it is, it, and when people trolled him, he laughed. He's like, "This is the funniest shit I've ever seen." Ty is great about yeah. that. Ty, Ty was actually the first person I had a conversation with him once. He goes, "You think you want to be famous? You think you want to be famous? You have no idea what it's like when you actually become famous. When everyone criticizes everything you do, and half of it is completely fucking made up. Right. That is the part where it makes it really crazy." And Bulgarian, I've talked to him about that too. It's like you, you, some I can never turn off. I can never go to a, a yeah. restaurant. No. This is that like this forever. And like uh, so that that's the part that that's really crazy and that uh people you know people don't actually realize how famous bill zane really is yeah because you see oh he's got 25 million followers no 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 he's got tens of millions of followers yeah. up on top of that that don't actually follow they don't him. follow him yeah and if he ever shows you what his story views look like they're crazy it's like 30 40 50 million views it's yeah. the most insane thing i've never seen anything like and i've seen the household name celebrities because i pay them for posts yeah i've never seen anything like Bozarian's actual engagement. It is mind boggling. Yeah, like a lot of guys will like they'll look at his stuff, but they're you know, they're mad at him because maybe Dan slept with their girl. You know what I'm saying? You know how it is. It happens. That's it happens, you know. Sorry, he didn't know. He didn't know it was your girl. But like that does happen. A lot of people will watch his stuff that don't follow him. So I agree. It's a thirty two million right now, actually. Yeah, there I, believe. You go. I believe I just you I don't know if you saw the interview I did with him. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I listened to the whole thing. Yeah, so, so that's the thing. I told Dan, I was like, Dan, I'm not gonna get you the, the engagement now, boys is I won't. And I'm not gonna tell you I'm gonna get the you engagement. That uh that 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 
Logan Paul will, but I guarantee you, I will get you the most thorough podcast anyone has ever done of you, and you've you've heard it. Like yeah, I'm, it was really good because I I was there. I I know Lauren Blake. I know Lindsay Palace. I t- yep. I talked to all of them during the whole thing. I know Sophia Beverly, so I talked to them all during the whole thing, and you. And so that, I think I gave a little bit more three dimensional depth to him, and that's why you know that was that was my goal. And with you guys also, that that is my goal uh, to do that same thing. Um, you have a skill set. My father told me this a long time ago. He was a financial planner. That if you can, if you're good at sales, you never have to work a day in your life. You can do that. You can you can pick your own hours. The 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 <laughs> the highest paid guy at the company is the CEO. Second highest paid company guy is the head of sales. Third highest paid guy uh, paid guy at the company is the leading salesman, right? So uh, can you talk about? You said you credit your meteoric rise in business to your sales skills. Can you go over that? What what makes you different? What is it about your sales skills? Well, I, I've had a lot of practice. You know, I've closed. 20 to 30,000 sales at this point in my life. And, but, you know, when I was young working at that car wash, the customers would come in and they'd say, I want a $6 car wash and say, well, for $2 more, you can get your tires shined and your wheels clean. It's like, no, I, I really just want, it's like, but you know, the car looks a lot better that way. And, you know, you came here to have a good looking car, right? I would just go back and forth with them. Well, on a day when you're going to watch 500 or 1,000 cars in 10 hours, you don't have that much time. Yeah. So I had to get really good at figuring out how to handle objections up front. Yeah. So instead of showing up after, on a busy day, instead of having that conversation and practicing, my job is to show up and go kick their tire on the way in and go, man, your white walls are dirty as hell. You know. So if you get the, uh, the super special today, I'll throw in them, clean the white walls too, which is part of it anyway. Yeah. When, and then they're like, oh, yeah, how much is that? $12? Yeah, that's cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, it, so I had to learn these little nuances, but I got to practice my idea sometimes a thousand people in a day. You know, at this this car wash, and so and I worked there for, and those that when I say thirty thousand sales, I, I'm just talking about what we've done in the last five or six years. That's yeah. not even those car wash sales, yeah. you know. But, but that was really a foundation. Then going into uh, drug sales, right? I was the guy that you know wasn't the dude that sat around and waited for people to come. I would page everybody on Friday and be like, I got the hookup, come in. I remember I got, the Puerto Ricans the one time. I went and bought like ten pounds of weed and a bunch of meth and coke from them to sell, and they were like. You're white. I was like, well, thank you. It was very, you know, <laughs> very astute observation of you. And they said, well, we got all this LSD and the uh, the brothers in the essays, they don't want none of this shit. Like, maybe you take it. You're white. You take the LSD. These fuckers gave me like 10,000 hits of LSD, right? Like, just for free. Just like, yeah. we don't want it. It's not good for our customer base. <laughs> Dude, we were going to parties and throwing this shit out like it was confetti. Business you know? is business. Business is business, But that was right? the thing. I would yeah. be like, hey, call me. You buy a pound of weed, I'll give you a strip of acid for free, right? Oh like, God. I was... <laughs> I was always that guy. I'm always like, how can I get my hands on this shit yes. and move it? Yes. You know? Hey, you get that free LSD. You know, if it's a hashtag free. If you made it to this point in the podcast, hashtag free LSD. Go well, ahead. The opposite of free LSD is in like 2012 or 13, I bought some LSD with Bitcoin on the dark web. And it was like 25 Bitcoin or some shit that we spent to get oh, LSD. God, that's could like, you imagine, It's like bro. a fucking million dollars I spent yeah. to get high. Million. Oh, my God. <laughs> Literally $1.5 million. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Those are the days, man. Those are the days. <laughs> and and Bitcoin is no longer that price, and Silk Road no longer exists. You know? So, yeah, man. Uh, yeah. So, interesting life. So, but... In the mortgage world, uh, everybody calls you and they say things like, you know, what's your interest rate? Because that's what their grandpa taught their dad. And that's what their dad taught them to say to a banker. And I knew that was coming. So every time somebody called me, the first thing I want to do is like, why are you even talking to a bank in the first place? Because I knew they didn't want a mortgage. I knew they wanted a house. And as soon as I could get them to start talking about the house, they would no longer give a shit about what the interest rate was because I could be the guy to help them get that house. So you found their primary driver emotion. Exactly. You skipped to it, which made the sales more powerful and, and, and quicker, more efficient. Exactly. Which I call proactive objection handling, right? right? So like before they even thought to bring the objection to me, I've already discussed that, you know? Yeah. So uh, I have a sales process and one of the, the first steps is when you ask somebody, what made you decide to reach out to me? Sounds like a very, if you were in a conversation, hey, what made you decide to reach out to me? You don't think much of it. Yeah. But that's the most powerful question in sales because I'm implying that you made a decision, which is one of the hardest things to get a human being to do. You go ask your, your girlfriend, hey, what do you want? Food will keep her alive and she still can't decide where she wants to eat, right? <laughs> like, and so decisions are hard for human beings to make because it's like a finite, firm thing. 
And the first thing I'm doing is saying, hey, what made you decide to reach out? So whatever they say is an admission that they've made a decision to contact me. And just starting the ball right there changes everything. Compliance but loop. One exactly. compliance loop into the next one. That's exactly. incredible, man. So that's the sales skills that you use. Yep. And we'll get into a objection handling, but that is really interesting. Have you read um, uh, the 50 Cent book that just came out? Was it? Yeah, uh, Hustle Hard. Hustle, Hustle, Hustle Hard. Harder. You read yep. that? Okay. Yeah. Have you read that? I'd great recommend book. it. It's great, it's book. great because he lit, so he goes through life lessons because and he literally talks about yeah. management when he was a crack dealer in Queens. He goes over it's like these are the he, so every time there's a section and then he goes over the lessons that he yeah. learned and like dealing with the best book I've ever read about dealing with people who are haters is Hustle Harder by Fifty Cent. I did not expect that book to be so thorough and comprehensive, but it's really interesting because you take people from these different mindsets and you understand sales are sales. Human psychology yeah. is human psychology. I have Dr. David Busk coming on here December 3rd. I cannot possibly imagine. He is the, the you know basically the leading uh, psychologist in the world right. on evolutionary psychology, uh, the 10th most influential uh, psychologist in the world. He's coming on here. And we're going to be talking about this, about how human psychology is sort of pervasive amongst the entire species. So that is interesting. It doesn't matter if it's mortgage brokers or selling crack. It's like yeah. sales or sales or sales. You get to that it primary is. driver emotion and you understand what their actual motivation is. That's fan fantastic. Um, so going back to uh, this other thing, the Rewire podcast, can we talk a little bit about that? So one thing that I notice is you yell into the mic, which is a, a thing that I do, right? We, I end up breaking these levels sometimes when I, I have to back up a little bit. I, I've noticed that when I talk. Uh, the, the selective use of profanity, I also appreciate because that's something that I do sometimes. And then also like when you talk about one of the things I thought was really good because I've had this issue too. I sell a digital uh, online program. I, I let you see my funnel yesterday. I, should, I sent it to you. Uh, the, the number of guys who buy the product and don't do anything with it. I think oh, both yeah. of you guys can talk about this. The number of people who buy the product, don't do anything about it, and then complain about the product doesn't work. You know, I don't get a lot of complaints, but there's a lot of people that spend – so here's why. There's actually a, a scientific explanation for that. Most people are preconditioned that money solves problems. Yes. So when, when you're my coach and I come to you with a problem – they think that the exchange of money from me to you solved that problem, and there's no need for them to actually go take the product that actually solves the damn problem, right? right? So many people, because the hardest, the most painful part of that transaction is the exchange of money for most people, yes. right? And so once they've endured the hard part of exchanging for money, like most people just assume that the work is done, because in most cases, that's, that is the work being done, right? And so I don't get a lot of people that charge us back, but there is probably 20% of the people that buy from us that never do shit with That's it. That's incredible and we're to me, man. That's bonkers. But I have a doctor who spent $120,000 with me in the last three years as a client, and I text him this morning because uh, yesterday I mentioned him in a post just randomly, and he probably made hundred grand from the post that, that I mentioned him. Yeah. And uh, he's a male doctor, you know, uh, does stuff for dudes. And so I uh, probably, you know, like I said, probably made a hundred grand just from that fucking post. And he texts me this morning. He's like, you know, I still pay and I never make any of the meetings, but I still say it's the best fucking money I spend every month. You That's know? incredible. <laughs> That's why I actually had a, I have, an, uh, I have a live in mentoring program and I had one client come live with me for a while. And while I was living with me, he was like, how far are you through men of action? That's the name of my, my program. He's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know I had to do that. And I was like, <laughs> Dude, you're living with me. Do you understand how many people are like, they've gone through the program three times and he starts the program. Like, oh, I didn't know how to do it. He starts the program. He's like, holy fucking shit. I didn't realize I had, th this is incredible. He gets through my entire 12 hour program in like a couple of days and he's like taking notes and he's just asking me questions, but he didn't even think he had to do the program. Like you said before. So my program, I have 21 required books that they have to read. I mean, it's, I give my guys a lot of homework. It is a master class and a master's class. Both. It, I, I treat it like it's a, a, a graduate level program. And so, so these guys, I give them a ton of work, and the, then I've never had a single refund. I've never had a single chargeback. And because my program, I tell them ahead of time, this probably isn't for you if you don't want to work. And I do, you know, four free. I do four calls a week. They're each two hours long, group calls on Zoom. And I tell these guys it's going to be fucking hard. It's going to be fucking hard. It's going to be uh, every day. I tell them it's going to be hard. If you don't want to do this, leave now. Leave now. And it's really incredible the buy-in that I get. And then when I meet the guys, who are like, yeah, I'm only through like the first module of the first part. And I'm like, what are you? What are you talking about? Like, yeah. it's great. I will tell you right now. That interview with Dan probably made me over 100 grand. 
Like I'm not, not no exaggeration whatsoever with new clients. It was incredible because it's a social networking product. Right. And there he was explaining his whole deal. He, the, the setup, setup, the setup is literally one of my required reading in the evolutionary psychology section of my program. The setup is one of the re required readings books. And so is, um, the 50 cent book. It's also another one. Yep. So yeah, that's it. That's amazing. When I heard you say that, I was like, man, you get it too. Like it's the same problem that I have. Is this something that, that you see also? I, I end every event that I speak at and I ask the crowd for one favor actually do some of the things that I just said. <laughs> Hell yes. Yep. That's incredible. I think that does make us a little different from a lot of self-help speakers. I feel like you can kind of keep people in a cycle forever where they just don't do anything. You know, there is an accomplishment that people feel when they leave the Tony Robbins seminar sure. and they cry to their friend. And that accomplishment, that feeling is the accomplishment. Like now this is good enough. Like you said, I gave the money, therefore I should just be better because I gave the money, not the work that you have to do. And they used to get in a pill. Oh, exactly. You know, to fix the problem. You know, I had a bootleg, uh, sorry, Ty, I had a bootleg uh, SMA, MMA uh, login. It was a friend of mine who had bought it, and I watched it. I watched every second of SMMA, <laughs> so, Social Media Mastery thing. I watched every second of it, and, like, I can't even imagine these guys who paid all that money and didn't do it. That's that's bonkers to me. Well, there is two types of people in, in our industry, and uh, type A would be me. I can go to Thrive, walk in, Bobby Castro be on the stage, say one thing and go, fuck it, that's all I needed, and go work on that thing that he just said five minutes that just changed my life and go turn it into a million bucks, right? Then there's the other type of person that will sit there for three days and not go do anything that they learned from all 20 fucking speakers, you know? That's incredible. But like, literally, I have been to, I don't know how many events, I once paid 25 grand to go to an event. I walked in and within an hour, the dude showed me how to run Facebook ads a long time ago. Dude showed me how to run Facebook ads. I went, sat down, ran Facebook ads, never even went back to the event that I spent 25 grand on, but I made 20 grand that day and have been doing it since. The action, you know? the action is the thing, right? Yep. Yeah. It, by the way, evolution makes us that right. Which, which do you think evolution, natural selection selected for? The guy who felt sorry for himself stayed in the cave and did nothing for the tribe right. or the guy who went out and killed stuff, who was willing to do anything in order to kill? Who do you... It's Overthinkers just, get eaten. It, yeah, it's not... It's <laughs> It's not just who had the most status. Who was the happiest? Yeah. The guy who was doing shit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep. I always use the example of like Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen made the most money of any television actor. He had the most acclim. So people thought he was the funniest, paid him the most money. He got the most recognition. He had the most women. So he started having unprotected sex with porn stars, got AIDS, and started smoking crack. Like that's a lot. That's the definition of a lack of appreciation and the end of the struggle for you. And once the struggle ends, then all of a sudden these. That, that's why I love David Goggins' book. It's like, yep. dude, like I hope you're somewhere suffering. <laughs> like I love that. It's like that. That to me, I totally get that. I hope you're somewhere suffering. Like I, I go to the gym seven days a week, even when I'm. I don't feel. I feel shitty. I edit my own podcast. I, mean, I know I could hire someone else to do it. I need to edit these. So it's one of these things where, like, when you do that afterwards, now I feel the feeling of satisfaction. Now let's go to the gym. Now let's. You know what? I'm gonna get Dan Flashman on my podcast. No, no, you know what? I'm going to get Ryan Stuman on my podcast. That's the kind of David Buss, dude, you guys, you understand, like, That's I'm not crazy. usually nervous interviewing people. I'm going to be inter nervous interviewing Dr. David Buss, right? That's incredible. So that, that's you exactly feel like he's like, he, he like knows everything or is judging you or whatever. No, right? no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, Dr. Buss, you know, I did this and I went on a date with this girl and I used your, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, like, I'm, I'm curious what he's going to say, but we're both longhorns. So I'm excited. Uh, the other one is, um, handling objections. You probably both can talk to that. I think, I think thanks. Oh, he's way better. Yeah. Cause I, I handled it in advance. So I, how, I how do you handle I, it? Advanced? I might be delusional, but out of the 55,000 stores, I can't name one meeting that someone said no. That's incredible. I'll pass a lie detector test every time. Yeah. I can't name one time that someone said no when I was selling my energy. So, so talk about that. You do the work up front. What does that mean? That's, that's a setup. How do you so, set that up? So I remember in like, kind of like Eminem and 8 Mile when he said all the bad things about himself and then he dropped the mic. Yeah. What's the other rapper going to say? Right. In a sales meeting, they just are protecting their job. Yeah. Right. The buyer just doesn't want to lose their job because they could just buy... Red Bull, Monster, and Rockstar. Why would they buy my yeah. energy drink when there's 900 drinks and they know that these three sell? So immediately, I know that it's 3 to $4 for Red Bull, Monster, Rockstar. I'm only 2 bucks. Eh. Can't, can't argue with me about that. Yeah. I know what you make your profit margin on those cans. Eh. Can't argue with me that. You get more profit margin. Hey, you're worried about my distribution because I'm a little bit smaller company? Eh. I got Budweiser. That's incredible. Oh, you're not sure if I'm going to make it? Eh. I'm already at 7-Eleven and Costco and Ralph's and Bonds and Smith. I'm removing all the things that they, they could say no to in advance because I know they could say, oh, we got to wait till you're bigger. No, you don't. Oh, we gotta, you got to have the right distribution. You already got it. Oh, we're not sure about your price point. Yes, you do. Like everything about it is already there in advance. And so if they're just sitting there nodding their head, when is there a time to say, I literally don't ask. I don't ask for the order. 
at conventions and trade shows when I'm training sales reps and I'm teaching them what to do. If you don't ask for the order, you don't get the sale. It's your fault, right? A closed mouth doesn't get fed. Right. And so it's your fault. If someone walks up to your trade show booth and you don't ask for the sale, it's literally your fault because they are by definition at a convention, at a, at a sales trade show to buy stuff. Yeah. And too often people want to push it to, hey, let's follow up with you next week. They don't, want to, they don't want to be rude. Yeah. Why? You built a, a 200, you spent $200,000 on this booth. We need to talk to them about next week for you right here. Yep. I'm right here. I don't need a meeting about a meeting. And so my whole life's been about that. I just go for the sales in advance and I don't ask for the sale. I explain the sale. You, you, okay, got it. You don't ask for the sale. You explain it and you deal with the objections ahead of, yes. ahead of time. Yes. Okay. It almost reminds me of like Shaq running down the lane. He gets right underneath the basket. Once you get him the ball, he's going to score. Yep. Like he already did the work. Right. He's underneath the basket. There's nothing you could do to stop him once he gets to that point. That's, that's what it kind of feels like. You dealing with objections. You've done podcasts on this. Yeah. So um, anybody can get good at this by using this method. Go get you 25 index cards and write the objections that you get as a salesperson on one side of the index card. So uh, I don't have enough money, don't have enough time, need to talk with my partner, need a budget. There's 10 objections that every prospect's going to give you up front every fucking time. Like it's always going to be money, time, partner, spouse, some shit like that. Then write down some of the others, you know, a pricing deal, need to go, whatever. Now that there's no emotion, no customer, no nothing around. Read that objection to yourself and think about it and write down what you should say on mm. the back. So now you got some flashcards. Yeah. Okay. So now you can practice with these flashcards to prepare. Then when you're on the phone, a prospect throws you a, a curveball that you've never heard that objection before and you screw it up. That's fine. But go write that shit down. And then now without the emotion, write a rebuttal to it on the other side and study those flashcards. Then once you get good at it, you start learning how to plant that shit up front. So like you get to talking to That's somebody and, and you know to ask them, do you have a business partner? Is there anybody else that needs to be on the phone call to make a decision today? No. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, do you have 30 minutes for us to go through the presentation today? Right. You start handling, like Dan said, these objections up front before they even get to them so that they can't bring them up later and say 15 minutes into it. Oh, I got to go. Blah, blah. Well, you told me up front that. Yeah. You know, yeah, 20. It, now, if the truth is my objection, my uh, my presentation's boring, then just tell me that because I'll skip right to whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can just then it becomes a real sales conversation and it's no longer about the emotions of the objections. It's about, hey, I practiced for this shit and was prepared for it. And I know exactly what to say because I've read these flashcards. Have you so. ever done Lincoln Douglas debate? Uh, I have no you idea aware what that, what that is. is? It, it's a, it has to do with uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, I forgot what the Douglas's last name, but they were running for a governor of uh, Illinois. And this is a form of debate. There's another f a form of debate called extemporaneous. But in Lincoln Douglas debate, it is exactly what you talk about. We're about to have a debate on abortion, so I go over every objection for abortion, and it's a flashcard. It's yep. exactly the same thing. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that whole idea with flashcards. Yep. All right, so uh, the other one I was going to talk about is uh, I love this focus on your supporters, not your reporters. I the, the whole thing with dealing with haters. I know both of you have this issue where you're in again when people can't physically uh, empir empirically see where the income comes from, they make it make it up, right? You are one of the reasons. You talk about it in this in the book, the wires that when Dan won forty million off of uh, uh, off of uh, Alec Gore's and Sam Majid, he won ten off Sam Majid, forty two something like that off Alec Gore's. Um, you know from those wires, that's what Dan did at least make $50 million off of, of playing poker. Uh, in the situation with you guys, I'm sure there's a, especially used to sell drugs. I'm sure the words that come out, what, what, what are some of the ways that you deal with that? Or do you just ignore it completely? So I have this personally, and I tell Everybody everyone. loves Dan. Dan ain't got no damn yeah, that's, haters. That's, that's actually a good point. Dan may have no haters. I, I do have rumors, though. Okay. Right? I, I'll give you guys a real fun story in one sec. But yeah. I, I always say don't feed the trolls. Okay. Right? If, when Jeff Bezos donated $97 million a couple years ago to charity for a situation happened in the world, he donated $97 million. Literally every article, and you can still Google, the, Google them now, said, well, he didn't donate $100 million. Yeah. Oh, and to him, $100 million is like us donating this small amount. Do you know how many hundreds of billionaires that are out there that donated $0.00 yeah. and zero yeah. cents and didn't yeah. even consider donating 10 bucks? Yeah. He sent $97 million and you guys are talking crap about him? Yeah. Are you crazy? So I don't ever argue with trolls, right? The, nothing you can say will... Please them. They just want to get yeah. you to feed them. They want to react. And so yeah. and I explained this to the models because out of the 3,500 influencers we pay each year, 3,300 of them are girls. They're yeah. models. And they get dealt with it way more than anybody on the planet. And they're reading it and, and physically getting upset about it. And so I know it's hard to block and delete. But please, any girl listening out there, block and delete. Just block and delete. You will never change their mind. 
Anyways, so a fun rumor story from many years ago. So I'm downtown, uh, sorry, I'm in Pacific Beach in San Diego, and a friend of mine uh, gets into a, an altercation, right? He slept with this, somebody's girlfriend, yeah. and it's a small biker gang. <laughs> biker gang, here we go. Okay. So I'm at my place, and I, I'm living with some football players, like Daryl Russell, uh, okay. who, who passed away, and Ricky Williams. So these guys were living with me. Oh, that's right. Ricky's from San Diego. Yep. Uh, he's a Longhorn just like me. Yep. I went to college with him. Seven oh, really? years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we grew up on the same street, went uh -huh. to high school together. Anyways, so... I got a call at like 1230 at nighttime. I'm playing Soul Calibur with the football players. Everything's fine. Yeah. And it's my friend. He's like, I'm stuck here in this hookah bar. I can't leave. I just beat this guy up. I was like, oh, why'd you beat him up? He said, well, I slept with his girlfriend. I said, wait, you beat him up and you slept with his girlfriend? He's like, I'll explain when you get here. Just come over here. And so I grabbed two of the guys, not the football players, two other friends of mine. We're actually in real estate. And we get in the car. And we go down there. I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to go fight with the biker gang. I'm not really sure what the plan is, but I'm going to go help my friend get out at least. So we go to this hookah bar called Sinbad's Cafe. And we get there and I see there's like 14, 15 Ducatis and different type of bikes. Not like the Harley guys, like the Ducati guys. And I see the one main guy with a black eye and very upset. And as soon as I get there, like the biker guys are like, damn, we're going to take your boy out. Like we have to. I was like, hold on, let me just go talk to him. Let's figure this out. Blah, blah, blah. So I go inside and my friend's back there and he's and he's mad. I'm like, what are you mad about? You won. You won the fight. You and you slept with this girl. You yeah. slept with this girl and you beat him up in front of his friends. In front, like, what what else is there? What are you doing? Yeah. So I whisper to him, like, there's a back door here. You do realize that. Like, I can just pull the car to the back. Nobody will know the difference. We're gonna go through the back door. They're staying out front because they don't want to get arrested to come inside. Like, we'll go out the back and then we'll that's it. No, fuck that. I'm going out the front like a man. I'm like, you already won the fight and you slept with this girl. There's no more. I'm a man thing. You won. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. There's only a downside from here. You go outside with 14 bikers, you're going to lose. And the three of us are not going to help you win that fight. He's like, no, I'm going to walk out the front. I said, okay, stop. I'm going to go negotiate. We're going to figure out a way for a peaceful exit. And let's figure this out. So I go out there. I said, look, guys, the cops are already here. They already know something's going on because they're sitting like one block away. You're not going to all want to get arrested tonight. Let me just get him out of here and everything's going to be fine. Like you guys already squashed it. He's not going to sleep with your girl anymore. I don't know if you're going to be your girl. I don't think you're going to stay with her. Let's just move on. He's like, finally, two of the guys say to the, hey, to the guy that got beat up. If he leaves here peacefully, then let's let him leave. If he looks at you or says something to you, then we'll, we'll beat him up. Oh, no. I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> so I go tell my friend, I'm like, look. We're going to walk out there. We're going to walk to the left, straight to the car. We're not. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yes. Don't even look at him. Don't acknowledge you've already won. Keep this in your mind when you're walking. You've already won. No matter what he says or what he says to you, he's not going to fight you right now. He doesn't want to get arrested. Let's just walk. Okay, here we go. Start walking. We start to make that left, and he looks over, and he has to say something. No. And it's so, like, so potent. Like, you can just see. It's, like, right into the guy's soul. Kind of like an I told you so, right? Immediately, the guy rushes him, and the two bigger guys rush. My two friends are big guys. They're like, stop, stop, stop. Let's, we don't, nobody starts swinging. They're just like, stop, stop, stop. And I go and stand in front of my friend. Don't know why my reaction was stand in front of my friend when there's like an oncoming. And there's only two big guys out of the 14, because the rest are, anyways. And they both stop, and they don't do anything to me. And like, Dan, you just got to get him go. Just go. Okay. I don't know why this happened. So I start, I'm like pushing my friend back. I'm just like, back up, back up, back up. Everybody, the cops are right there. Let's not do this tonight. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like screaming like I'm commanding these 14 bikers. And I don't know what's happening. And so we're backing up, we're backing up, we're backing up. Finally, like two of the Russian guys that are part of the group, they walk over and, the, and they come to me like, are you okay? Everything okay? Are you not mad at us? So now I'm not mad. That's fine. Like it's the, it's not the situation wasn't with me. It's with him. He's like, but you're not mad at us, right? I said, no, I'm not mad. It's fine. Everything's fine. We're just gonna go. And so they like escort us. Like two of the guys that are part of their crew yeah. escort us. So get to the car. We leave. Whatever. So I have no idea what the situation was. Two weeks later, we're on a double date. Do you know who the double date's with? Who? My friend is with that guy's girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I'm. Whatever with the other girl. So when did this girl end up in Victory Poker? That's no. my, what I'm really trying to understand. No, I'm just so kidding. we're now downtown. Oh, story's almost over. We're downtown. We're at the gas lamp quarter. 
and we're right in front of a place called Moose McGillicuddy's where a lot of the bikers okay. hang out. We're at the stoplight. I'm in my Lincoln Navigator with wheels on it and the stereo system. I'm like I'm this flashy kid at the time, in my early 20s. And my friend is sitting shotgun, and the two girls are sitting in the back. The guy runs up, the one that got beat up. Boom! Sucker punches him through the window. Yeah. Okay, like a jackrabbit punch. Not a hard punch, but yeah. like a jackrabbit punch, and then runs back to the bar. I park the car. It's a one-lane road in yeah. downtown Gaslamp Court. I park the car, and I get out, lose my mind, and I run after him. Okay? I'm chasing the biker in the street. <laughs> Talking about it makes me feel weird uh -huh. explaining this to you. I chase him, and I get there. And there's the two Russian guys. Yeah. They pick up the guy, their friend, up into the air, up against the wall. Like, you're never going to do this to Dan again. Yeah. Like, literally, like, shaking him up against the wall. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on. Okay. My car, everybody's honking their horn because I'm parked in the gas lamp quarter. Get back in the car. My friend doesn't, like, he's upset. He wants to go fight. I'm like, you're not going to fight. There's yeah. a whole game. We start to go. And the girl behind me, this is our first date. Okay. She's the friend of this girlfriend. Yeah. She's like, you're not going to kill them, are you? What? Is this, is this some Russian so I was like, mafia thing? What, is, what do they so think? I was like, I was like I'm, what do you mean I'm not going to kill them? She's like, well, they're all worried. They've all been talking about it for a while now. They think that you're going to kill them. <laughs> what? So, so this whole group has this in their mind that I'm part of the Russian mafia. Okay. But not just thinks it. They're like positive about it. Like they had an actual sit down meeting the day after where they talked about what they would do and if some of them should move, like they held it all planned out <laughs> thinking that I'm in the Russian mafia. So anyways, don't feed the trolls. There's no point in arguing. Can, let people think if you're in the can, Russian mafia. Can we give a little context? You were not born in San Diego. Can you talk about where you were born and how you I was not born in Russia either. <laughs> well, I was born in the outskirts of Russia. It's called Riga, Latvia. Okay. And no, I'm not in the Russian mafia. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just that I was young, right? You start having money early yeah we were in everybody's stores like i had 93 rap vehicles at the time so everywhere you went you saw energy drinks you saw my brand we had Na we were the first one with a nascar we were everywhere at yeah. the time so from a business guy perspective i thought i could understand that but for them they just saw flashy life or flashy right. world or whatever and so that's where the rumor came from anyways long story short uh th there's no point are you because i i told them all. I finally went back, like, I think it was like a month or two months later. I saw them and I told them, ha, ah, it's funny, blah, blah, I'm not in the mafia, da, da, da. And some, one of the guys was like, yeah, someone who's in the mafia would say that they're not in the mafia. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> There's no That's like wags in that cash you gave them. Nobody believes it's fake. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that. You just, there's no point arguing. There's yeah. no point in feeding the trolls. They're never going to change their mind. They just want the reaction. There's no point explaining yourself to people. They're going to think something, no matter what you do. The reason I talk about personal branding so much is you have to tell the audience who you are. Otherwise, they're going to make up stories for you. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, well, that's part of the reason why I started this podcast. I mean, I can't, um, I can't tell you all the different things. Apparently, I'm a trust fund kid and a pimp and uh, all these other things. And I was like, mm, I think it's time for me to right. you know, make, an, uh, make my own statement about that. That's, a, that's pretty, pretty incredible. You dealing with the haters. You know, I used to have a, a lot more than I do now. But uh, people get mad every now and then. Like this week, some dude like created four different accounts uh, around my nose. Like he said something in a in, in Instagram DM uh, reply to my stories. He's like, "Dude, your nose is huge." And I'm like, "Had it my whole life. You know what I mean? Been made fun of my whole life for you think you're teaching?" But I don't say nothing. I just block the dude. Then, because I don't want to deal with that shit, right? Yeah. Then the dude made a. Ryan's nose at Ryan's nose on Instagram account and started like commenting on all my fucking posts and shit like that. It's like this dude's got a seven inch nose, <laughs> like which is kind of funny. You know what I mean? It's kind of, it is I would funny. I would have shared the but it's like thing. but that's the kind of shit that you know yeah, that, sure. that I have to deal with. Uh, I, I I finally did a video. It's like the reason why I have this big nose because air is the only thing they haven't taxed. It's yeah. still free. I'm gonna yeah. get mine. Unless you know, <laughs> but um, the reality of it is, you know, every now and then I'll have people that'll say, you know. Um, I had a guy the other day say, oh, his that that watch is fake or those aren't real diamonds or whatever. You know, oh, he he rents those jets like, yeah, no shit. I rent them. I don't own them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but but I don't ever hide anything. So yeah. it's always like they're always saying something that's Captain Obvious anyway. I think the only reason 
you really care about a troll or a hater is if they have some truth to it. Like the Russian mob doesn't bother you because there's no validity there. You could give a shit. Yeah. You know, the uh, the fake jet or fake Lamborghini doesn't matter to me because I'm going to drive it whether you think it's real or not. You yeah. know what I mean? So um, they used to bother me, but there comes a level where it's like, hey, that's just part of it. You know what I mean? It, it is hard to just like give up the idea that you can change their mind. I mean, two examples for me. I had... Uh, somebody that I was seeing and when we broke up, I thought it was amicable and then she just started lying to some of my sponsors about me And they just believed her and I was it like happens a well, lot. let's can we can we talk about that? No, no, we can't talk your at your ex said something about you It must be true and I'm like we, we can't I'm a decorated US military officer I don't even get a chance to defend myself. Oh, no, 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 you're obviously guilty. You're obviously guilty. and I mean it, It's just like it that part is crazy and then 48 hours ago, I got to tell you guys, one of the reasons why I'm so happy doing this podcast is because you guys are not flat earthers. I did three hours and 40 minutes with two flat earthers. And then like the idea of us trying to change each other's mind did not happen. I just tried to present bo both points of view. And one of the worst parts of it is, like I said before, how do we know, you know the size of a star? Well, we know it through spectroscopy, parallax, and we, know, we can look at the, how gravitational pull works. And we can tell the size and the, and the makeup of a star or, or our sun or Jupiter or any of these other planets by using those different things, right? Well, that I just explained that in what thirteen seconds. Their explanation of why that's not true is four, and I, it was like fifteen minutes long with videos showing all this, like a dome over the Earth and all this. And I'm like, a and dome by, over the Earth. yeah, by the end of it, it's like you forgot spectroscopy, spectroscopy, gravity, and parallax. You forgot those three things, so now you don't. What, what did Michael say? I don't even. And then I was like, now Johnny Cochran, I get it. I understand why why you, you why you hire Johnny Cochran because he's just gonna keep talking Barry Shack and F. Lee Bailey and it, um, uh, Shapiro. That's why OJ hires those guys because they just keep talking and talking and talking till you get to the point where you just don't even remember what the objection was. And it was just like very. It's like oh man, I can't change these guys' minds. Like no matter what I do, I can't. No, no matter what happens, we fake the moon landing. The Earth is flat. And it was just like it, oh man, I, I can't really do this. But I I tried. You know what I'm saying? But afterwards, I remember just thinking like. Changing their mind was never even, never possibly an option, but that's really interesting. Uh, but maybe, maybe, and I'm not that person, but like maybe the moon landing's fake, right? Maybe we've been to the moon now, but the original one could or couldn't be fake. I don't know. Right. But flat earth, that's really fucking hard to believe in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's some shit that was solved in 1492. It's 2021. But I'm saying that, that argument was solved, like, you know what I'm saying, centuries ago and but like the moon landing, it's like okay, maybe we don't know, blah right. blah blah, right? But like, but we there's like millions, if not hundreds of thousands of people that have literally circled the globe, yeah. <laughs> right? Like yeah. in boats, in planes, like no, no, they believe they believe that those people just went around a circle on a flat plane. No, the, the that the proofs that I gave them, like for instance. How do you see the Southern Cross? There and, would be boundaries. Oh yeah, so the boundary is Antarctica. They believe Antarctica has a seventy or is a sixty thousand mile long coast, and it goes all the way around the planet, all the way around this flat disk. It's it's insane. I mean, I know it sounds crazy. The other one was uh, how how come I'm in Australia, I'm in South America, and I'm in South Africa. When I look to the south, I see the same Southern Cross, but I'm facing in three different directions. How's that possible? And they're like, oh yeah, during the night the Southern Cross rotates around the planet. I'm like. No, it doesn't. It doesn't do that. But just little things like that. I make a point. My point is concise. My point is accurate. Let's go on to the next point. They completely forget about it. 15 minutes later, they've shown me an example. Well, what had happened was... Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I, I hope you guys get a chance to watch it. It is one of the wildest... Because I, I have a background in astronomy and physics, and so I'm. they're asking questions that they think I don't have an answer for, and I'm like, no, the reason why the shuttle is shaped like it is is because it has to go through 60 miles of atmosphere, then it speeds up to 17,500 miles an hour. It doesn't speed up to 17,500 miles an hour in the atmosphere. Atmosphere, but they didn't. And then the reason why it has a heat shield is because it burns up on the way in, not on the way out. Just stuff like that. And then no credit. Change the subject. Let's go on to the next one. And that, that's I dealt with that for three hours and forty minutes. You know what I'm saying? Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm just I'm glad to be talking to you guys. This is, this is why I advise every influencer, to, and not not just influencer, but everyone in general. I don't I don't ever let people post about politics, religion, or current events. Right. Here's why: fifty percent of the people agree with you. Yes. Fifty percent of the people don't agree with you. 50% that agree with you can't agree with you anymore. Yeah. Right? They are capped out. They are at 100% agreement. The other people that don't, are, that are 0%, you will never change their mind. Yes. Give you a quick example. You take a Jewish guy and a Muslim guy and we lock them into this room every day for the next 30 days. Just one hour a day. Never, out of the 30 days, are they going to walk out and be like, you know what? I'm going to switch to become Muslim. Yes. Never. Not once. Not, may happen. not maybe once in a blue moon. No, just never. It's never going to happen. And so why am I going to argue in that scenario? And that same thing applies with someone that likes Trump versus Biden or likes this versus this or likes this versus that because they grew up believing it and they were told something or they were forcefully told something. They are not going to change their mind. Yeah. Sad but true. So one, life is short. I'm not going to waste time arguing about yeah, something like that. Point. 
Two, I like to win. And so I'm not going to go into arguments that I can't win because by default, they are never going to believe me. Even when I show them facts, like you just showed them, the flat yeah. earthers, you show them facts. They couldn't even, their heart rate didn't change one iota. Right. You're actually crazy to them. <laughs> yeah, they're talking correct. about you right now the same way you're talking about that. Yeah, no yeah. shit. Yeah, they, they probably are. Yeah. They're like this fucking guy yeah. for three and a half hours. hundred percent. And with his little twenty second replies, like he yeah. doesn't know what he was talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, for, yeah. for sure. I, I, I'll blank these out, but uh, I don't know if it, like believes the earth is flat. Believes the earth is flat. Uh, believes the earth is flat. I guarantee you, some of the models you you have. You represent believe the earth is flat. Sure. You should do. You should do it. I did one survey. Obviously, it's not scientific. It's about twenty one percent of people said that they thought the earth was flat. I've read surveys. It's about two percent of the population believe it's fat, and seven percent are like on the on the fence and don't know. That's the thing. We didn't address it, and now this is happening. And two that's percent. That's one hundred and forty million that is people. Crazy, but yeah, it's it's unbelievable <laughs> the amount of people that li literally because and it's not that they believe the earth is flat. It's just somebody somewhere sure. their authority. You know, maybe, dude, I know one person, it was because of sexual assault, and one authority figure assaulted her. Therefore, all authority, authority was bad. Therefore, the earth is flat. Nothing the government tells you is the truth, and that's kind of where we get go down this path. So I thought it was really interesting. Um, uh, we talk about the force of gravity. Let's talk about the force of average, something that you talk a lot about, and I think is really, really interesting uh, how it just kind of feels good to just, oh, I just made a couple thousand dollars, and I get sucked into this average thing instead of the growth. Can you talk about a little bit about the force of average? Yeah, so in my life, if you uh, if you haven't kind of figured this out, it's had like meteoric highs and rock bottom lows, like right. over and over again. Um, when I was young, I, I moved around a lot. I've always lived in Texas, but I moved around a lot because I was adopted. Uh, my parents split up. I was adopted. My grandfather owned some banks, and they ended up building this huge banking empire, and then the savings and loans crashed, and my right. grandma went to prison. Like, you know, like uh, I went to made some money selling drugs, then went to prison, then came out, made millions of dollars doing mortgages, went back to prison, came out, made hundreds of thousands of dollars, got divorced again and got shut down. So I'm like going through these ups and fucking downs. Every time I think I met the girl of my dreams, we get married, like where we start dating or we move in together, shit falls apart. Every time I got a business that's going in the right direction and I start making money, shit falls apart. And then for most people, it's like we talked about with real estate agents, like one month they make 10 grand and then the next month they don't make any money at all. And they're like, oh shit, and they got to scramble and they're running this roller coaster, the commission roller coaster, right? I got tired of all that shit. I got tired. I, I enjoy the meteoric highs, you know? I enjoy the getting out on stage, what's up Vegas? And you know, the writing the million dollar checks and getting the million dollar checks and all that. But man, the rock bottom shit had to go. You know what I mean? Like the overdose on cocaine, the the divorce, the heartache, the losing employees, the the friends, the betrayal, the all these things that that are the bad side of things that happen. And I, I put, I need to take like the way that my brain works on my intelligence level is I need to take big complex shit and make it simple so I can understand it. Yes. And all I know is that I'm tired of the I, I'm tired of my life going up and down, but I don't want to be in the middle. Right. The opposite of, of meteor high and meteor low is somewhere in the middle, which is like average. I don't want to be that person. Yeah. But I started realizing that on this planet, let's assume that this is a not flat, but it's a coded. Uh, it's it's an, it's got an algorithm on okay. the planet. Right. And I call that algorithm the force of average, because if you're poor and you live in uh, San Diego or Los Angeles or Las Vegas, you can go stand on the strip and somebody will probably throw you $20. You know what I mean? Maybe even 100 bucks, right? Um, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of people. It's pretty easy for someone to go, that's a way below average fella. I'm going to help them out a little bit. Right. You can get social programs from the government, free Starbucks coffee. You can get free food at the food pantry. All these things to try to help you be an average person. So if you're right? below average, there's a force that takes pulls you to you average. Up. Pulls yeah. you up to average. Got right. it. If you're average, it's perfect, right? They keep you in your comfort zone, your little $80,000 a year job with your 2.3 kids and your public schools and your, you know, what is it, white picket fence and all yep. this shit and, and your 28% tax rate and the world will just keep you happy and you will never you will never experience a Lamborghini or having a threesome with, with Playboy models or swimming in a pile of cash, but you I'm and your one for, girl. I'm one for three there. And you and your one, your one girl with your 2.3 kids and your average home will keep you comfortable the rest of your life and you'll be convinced that God wants you to be humble or whatever the case may be. And I'm not knocking that shit, yeah. right? But I've had all three. Yeah. I've had average, below average, and I'm telling you, I flew here on a $50 million jet and I will take that every fucking time versus fucking being you know, homeless or whatever the case may be because I've been both. But here's the thing. 
when you start beating average and you start chasing greatness, you start making a little bit more money. What do you find out? Oh, there's more rules against this shit. Yes. Right. Oh, and then there's people that they got their hand out too: government agencies, city agencies, politicians, lawyers, all these like scam artists, all these people got there. So the more you push through the threshold of, of average, the more the force is trying to push you back down. Right. Like I said, higher tax rate, unexpected expenses, struggles that you didn't expect, people that give up on you, people like it, dude. And so, how many people they go and they get on a diet and they lose a bunch of weight and then they get fat again, right? We see it happen all the time, right? And it happens in every area. So I got tired of this shit. So I needed to identify what it is. What what was the enemy that kept every time I got up? What was the enemy that pushed me back down? And so I, I gave it an identity, the force of average. And the force of average has one job and one job only, and that's to distract us. Okay. We see 32,000 ads on average a day as an American. We have to make over 50,000 decisions a day as a human being. And the force of average is trying to keep you from making the right decisions and staying on the right path, right? But our superpower that we possess is focus. Yeah. And right now, the force of average knows that it's a superpower to the point to where most people are taking like performance enhancing drugs just to make it normal. They have ADD and they're taking focus pills so that they have normal focus, which actually makes their focus weaker, which right. actually keeps them more average. Got it. And so I've learned this system called the G code, which I wrote a book about that's on Amazon, where it's basically four areas that you focus on every day of winning. Right. So the, the key to that greatness and to beating that algorithm is is winning. So what am I going to win in every day? I'm going to win with the right mindset, a grateful mindset. Yeah. Right. I'm going to win in, in my genetics, go and make sure that I eat the right foods and that I exercise. You said you work out seven days a week. Yeah. I'm five. I'm, I'm, I need to rest two days a week, but I'm active seven days a week. Yeah. But I'm, I have a personal same trainer thing. five same days thing. a week. Same thing, yeah. uh, then on your grind, your job, you got to go there and you got to show up and make your money for the day. And then also in the group of people that you're surrounded with. But if you will live every day and I've been doing this, I could pull it up on my phone for uh, over a thousand days now where I go in every single day. I write down five things I'm grateful for. I make sure that I worked out and ate good. I make sure that I invest my time into somebody specific. Like instead of being at the event, I'm here with you. You're going to go on my list today. So will you, yeah. right? Uh, as the person I put my time in and then what did I do to be successful on my job? So like today, private jet with clients, then went to Michael Sartain's podcast with Dan Fleischman, like document and all this shit. So every day I know I'm winning, beating that motherfucker. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful, man. That's awesome. The force of average. That's yep. incredible. So, can you talk about it? Like, so we have a somebody who has a business. The business goes from ten thousand to a hundred thousand, hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. Is there a force of average there? Like, what's a what's a, a pitfall? Like, I I'll just g give you an example. For me, last year uh, I was working with a different company. We did about four hundred thousand in revenue. This year, in the first three months since I left them, I felt like they were really holding us back, especially with like cold traffic and stuff. A quarter million in the first three months. So we're on pace to, to go to seven figures. What are some of the pitfalls we could run into with our business? What what business? What kind of business? Uh, it's an online mentoring thing. Online so mentoring. I have two hundred. I have two hundred clients right now. It's about per client. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, first of all, congratulations yeah. on that. You know, um, the the biggest thing that I have had to do in in that industry because I have about two thousand people paying that or more. Yeah. Um, and the biggest thing that I've had to do is duplicate myself. Yes. And, and that is the hard thing as well. So let's say Dan, Dan's going to be my man. He's been a good client and I'm going to put him to be a coach. Okay. So he's going to duplicate me for a certain number of clients. Right. Yeah. But after Dan works with me for two years and everybody tells Dan how great he is, all of a sudden he's like, why do I really even need Ryan in the, the first place? Right. I'm going to go out and start my own coaching program and keep all, all the money. Right. Similar so situation. You'll yes. run into that. I, I'm much like Dan. We've been hanging out for forever at this point. Pretty pretty uh pretty often and so i i've learned to think a lot like him so what i've done is i present my coaching stuff it's like hey, michael if you want to be a coach on your own you're going to be able to handle about 10 people until your margins go down and you'll yeah. not be able to scale and that's the max i've already built this at scale so if you really truly want to help a lot of people i've built a system that you can help a lot of people around and get in with us and you don't even have to coach them all so it's just like he says they they're charging you four dollars a drink i'm two dollars a drink right. right so i've already built this at scale and if you were to build a company as big as mine you would find out that those are going to be your fucking numbers when you get right, to the final right. workout anyway you know so yeah and so, so you're going to run into guys guys and girls that, that are on your team that want to be your competitors right and i always say 
and I learned this from my pastor, is I always leave people in a better spot than you found them. So even if they will become your competition, man, maybe even send them the deals that you don't like, right? Maybe Dan wants to do business with you. You're like, oh, I don't like the way that he does things. I'm going to send him over to Stuman yeah. because even though Stuman screwed me over and started his own thing, now I got a place to push people that still need help that I don't want to fucking help yeah. to. That's that's incredible. Yeah, um, that, that's, that definitely makes a, a big difference. As far as the scalability, maybe something you can talk about also. Uh, I found that info products where I'm recording myself, right? So like uh, even I got the idea from the master's course. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like the Neil deGrasse Tyson and they have yeah. a, um, what's his face? Steph Curry. He has a, a class on shooting. Life changing, by the way. I play basketball all the time. Um, it, can you talk about the scalability that way? And then also Zoom. Dude, Zoom has made things a lot. The, the Ed Milet's Zoom calls are like notorious now, right? Can you talk a little bit about the scalability by duplicating yourself? Yeah, so for my masterminds, I have 22 instructors, so okay. it's not about me. And in yep. the Avengers Mastermind, we have eight instructors, so it's not about me. Okay. So I That's the big secret with all this shit. In advance, I knew that I couldn't be the one doing everything. Okay. Right? There's most masterminds or most people that are... When you go to Ty Lopez's event or you go to RHA with Andy and Ed, you want them, right? You're tagging on daddy's shirt. You want them to give you attention because right. they're the two founders. In mine, I have 22 instructors and eight instructors. Got it. Because it's, I don't, I knew in advance, I didn't, I couldn't physically respond and give everyone what they wanted. So I put in front of me a whole bunch of really qualified people to be the instructors, which is what Ryan kind of mentioned. If you find instructors or you find members that are part of your group that can level up to become instructors, definitely do that because okay. that will help you time wise. Or if there are other people that are out there that are in a similar space that you respect, figure out a way to bring them on and give them either a little equity or a little bit of cash and let them be also faces of it where it's still the Michael, Michael Sartain, it's, you're the brand, but now you have one, two or three other characters that can help time-wise because you go from 200 people to 500 yeah. and 1,000, how are you going to handle it? I, t right. I told that to my clients. I'm like, you guys really, because I have an idyllic memory. I, I, I was like, I remember where almost every one of these guys is from. One of the craziest things that started happening to me is when I started doing one-on-one -on -one calls with people I've never met before. And they're yeah. like, yeah, I've, I've watched 100 hours of your programming. He's like, I watch it at, I live in Singapore, so I watch it at double speed. Like you met, because I, I recommend everybody learn how to speed watch everything. Double speed, triple, do you, all of you can learn to do triple speed. It just takes a while. 2.5 is like easy. It's like benching 200 pounds it's like nothing I, I tell them to do that so they don't watch me live anymore and so they come to me they they quote 50 things that i've said before and i'm like blown and i've never met this kid before you know and i told some of my clients i was like you understand there's gonna be a point where i have a thousand clients and i'm not going to be able to remember that of you're course. from here you went to this high school that you're a longhorn that you're a giants fan I, I right now i can remember it all but like once we get past 200 i don't know how much i'm going to do so, so you're right getting ahead of it so my online Usually it's only 50 the average person can only keep up with about 50 right right right, right. Like that. so my online courses are all done through lightspeed vt com which is here in Las Vegas with, okay. with Bradley. So all of them, my personal branding course, my 100 Million Academy, everything's through lightspeedvt.com because it's interactive. So you can now make your training courses instead of you just answering a bunch of questions for everything. Yeah. Th that might be a girl that joins your group or a guy that joins your group. Or, hey, are you above 50 or under 50? Oh, I see you're above 50 and then you just got divorced. Yeah. Oh, have you been divorced more than once? Oh, I see you've been divorced more than once. Let's talk about this. You actually can teach them based on who they are, even though you never talk to them, you never meet them. And so interactive is what you'll end up needing when you get to 500, 1,000 plus people. Yeah. Because not everybody is 20 years old from Singapore. Some of them are going to be 58 years old and divorced. Some of them are going to be rich and some of them are going to be broke. Some of them are like, it's different. The, what you're teaching them, whether it's for dating, whether it's for how to be a man, whether it's for how to get a job, whether it's for how to build their career, how to get a better network, et cetera, the things that you're teaching them, will be different based on being 20 years old in Singapore or 58 living definitely, in Las Vegas definitely. or 42 in Texas and whether what type of profile you are. And so having that, adding that element, I would reduce your two hour calls to one hour calls Yeah. Uh, because one, you would need the longevity of them wanting to keep coming back over yeah. and over. And two, you don't want them to always expect two hour calls. Yeah. So that's we, been a problem. I just, I tell them I'm, I'm not leaving until everybody gets their questions answered and I'll sit there until everyone gets their questions answered. But yeah. That's kind of a new, I don't know what, like I just, this feeling I have is like, man, I can't end this because I want to make sure everybody, and you're right. I, I at some point I got to, mathematically I gotta that, that won't work because what happens when you go from 200 to 500, Yeah, that's a problem. 500 to a thousand. Exactly. And so I set that precedence in advance because you can always go up, but you can never go down. Meaning once you start, once your price is this, you, you can't, raise it people are going to get upset you can always go lower yeah and so i like to lead with higher price points i like to lead with uh you're going to get limited amount of time and people like it uh, i also make them take action in your scenario two hours every 
like we do a one hour call every Thursday for all three groups. Yeah. Nobody's ever complained about it. But more importantly, I'm barely on it. Oh, okay. Hey, Stuman, can you host for me this Thursday, 5 p.m.? Yeah, sure, buddy, of course. Why does he want to do it? One, he's my friend. But two, more importantly, he knows those are hundreds and hundreds of people that paid uh, either 100K or 30K or $1,000 to be there. I also get so, the feeling, Ryan, you like talking. You yeah, like talking yeah. on these things. Like, you're like me. Yeah, it's like one of these things. Like If, if, you, if you guys say, hey, man, we're going to do a mastermind, Michael, I need you to talk for seven hours. I'm like, not even a problem. No notes, nothing. I'll go seven hours, not even a problem. Yep. So in your scenario, you can bring on guest speakers. Yes. And by doing that, it, it freshens, thing up, freshens things up. It keeps it live for everyone, but also just reduces everyone needing you. They're yeah. always going to want to tug that's on you point, yeah. and that's going to, that's going to change. Also, last thing, the way you go from 200 to 500 to a thousand, it's just gasoline on the fire. Whatever you did to get you to the 200, nothing changes for you getting 500 or a thousand. Right. It's just how to do more of the same. Now there's efficiencies that come along with that because things break when you get too big, because if you can't answer all their questions, you will get, you will have people leave you, right? People are going to, there's going to be attrition. Yeah. It just happens. Um, you will have people upset with you because you couldn't answer their question and you couldn't do this one thing or two things by setting really, really clear standards in advance, which sounds like you do by telling them, uh, how hard it is and et cetera. You should also look at Bedros Koulian. Bedros, the way he trains, the way he teaches, it's all about how men become men. Yeah. And he takes them through intense courses, intense weekends, intense situations where they're literally like getting yelled at by Navy SEALs and yeah. having to climb through the dirt and run up and down a hill for four hours straight. Like, but more importantly for you as a person, watching his training style and how clear he is about how he teaches is fascinating. I will he, definitely do that. A hundred percent. Uh, do you, do you yell at your clients ever? Uh, I used to not so much lately, but, uh, I gotta yeah, stop, I man. To. I, I yell at my, when they do, yep. it's like, man, you've asked the same question six times. I love you, man. But what is the problem? Where is the critical thinking breaking down? And I'm slapping the table. I'm like, how has this happened six times? I don't want you to, uh, the, the, um, I'm fine with you asking this question, but I want you to ask yourself a question. Why have you asked the same question six times? And every time got a satisfactory answer. Why was this not the first thing you thought about when I've given you these resources? You know, I'm on your side, man, but you need to ask yourself. And I get like that. I get really intense because I, I, I get, man, I get too involved, man. I, I genuinely care about their, their, um, their, I think that's the reason why I've never had a refund because I, I'm so obsessed with them improving their, their lives. You know what I'm saying? And so many of them do. And it just becomes this huge thing. By the way, Jesse Preston, she's uh, one of the guest coaches on yep. there. Kindly Myers comes on on my Monday yep. calls for me. Uh, Sunday daytime. Sunday at one is my international students, the ones that are in Australia, um, or then other, you know other places, different time zones. Monday is my free call where I have a bunch of models come on because we talk about event planning and stuff like that. Tuesday is for my uh, the guys who brought the first program. Thursday is for the guys who bought the advanced program. So that's how I end up with four four two hour calls per week. But you're right, I do I do need at some point to 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 scale myself back to, and then sometimes I do seventeen one on ones per week, uh, but they're all over Zoom. So yeah, that is. That is, I am kind of turning myself sideways, and then I edit this program also. So yeah, that is uh, you, you're bringing up some really great points that I need to uh, pay a little bit more attention to. So that's great. You're going to scale by something called critical mass. Yes, you're at a point now where people are just talking about you. Yeah. yeah, your podcast gets bigger. You get more members. You get more girls around you. They're posting about you and talking about you. Whether you ever spend a dollar on ads or not, you're just going to keep growing by critical mass because everybody's buzzing, yes. buzzing about you. And so you got to nip these things in the bud now, yeah. not, not later. All right. So the three main questions I had about growing a business, the first one was objections and you guys handled that. The second one was what we talked about, about scalability. The third one is lead gen. I actually think lead gen is like, maybe I, I cause I don't know enough about this, but I think lead gen is the hardest. And to me, like the thing that would, would cause the most explosive growth. What, what do you believe as far as lead gen? What do you believe as far as lead gen? If you ask all of your guys to refer you to people, you double your business. Okay. That's, you're not, you're there not, you go. You're not going to close both of their friends that they refer you to, and some will refer you three, four, or five. Some will refer you zero. But if you ask your 200 guys right now to refer you to people that you think might gain benefit from joining the yeah. Man of Action group, you double yeah. the size of your business. Yeah, we went from 60 to 200 mainly because of that, because of, of testimonials yeah, and referrals. And, and also having ma a clear intention from you're asking your current people and the girls to post about you not just post about the fun you. Yeah. Like if all those girls actually said one, well, just not all the time, but once in a while about your man of action course. Yeah. It, no, it's been incredible. <laughs> your website would break. Yeah, for sure. Right. I own a software uh, company called phone sites.com. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do is we help the average business person generate leads. I, I believe you need really three things to get leads. You need a offer an audience 
and a website, right? Okay. And an offer is if I'm going to sell uh, fitness training, it's like, hey, sign up for uh, free 30-minute training this Monday at 2 p.m. Enter your name, email address, and phone number for more details of where to show up, right? Like, you've got to offer, but... If you put that in front of a bunch of ripped people, they are probably not going to, you know, people that are already fit. If I yeah. put that in front of Jay Cutler and Steve Kuklo, they're probably not going to want to show up at that. So I got to make sure I got the right offer for the right audience. And then some way, you know, a website is the way to do it to capture their information. Most people, <clears throat> most business owners, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs don't have a website because they can be tens of thousands of dollars. They're very expensive. Yeah. Uh, or the website they have, they built on Wix that looks like absolute shit. And, it, and it's just a website that displays where their location is and what they sell. Right. Not any way for you to actually buy something or get on their email list or any of that stuff. And what Phone Sites does is it gives the average entrepreneur with no tech skills the ability to create a website, put that offer up on it, and get it on social media or the internet or whatever within a matter of minutes. Like you can have zero tech skills, never done anything on the web other than Facebook, log into my software and within 15 minutes have a website that you can post on Facebook to get leads. That's incredible. Yeah. And this, it's a fairly new company. We're a couple years old, but this week we just passed a million leads for our users. So that was pretty cool. I need to, I need to definitely check that out. Uh, we haven't gotten to cold traffic. Uh, almost all of our leads come from either my TikTok or my Instagram. Well, even still yeah. with, uh, with me, the majority, I, I run the largest sales group on Facebook. It's 104,000 members and been running that since 2014, uh, 2013. And uh, most of our leads come from there, just organically working that group of people. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't ran ads for three years now, four That's years crazy. now. So yeah, it's it is, all referrals. It is one of these things where if you we, do a good job, they want to send you their buddies. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah. fuck, Dan made me rich. Hey, you should go see Dan. He made me fucking rich. You know, yeah. like that's the the best referral you can get. Absolutely. That's incredible. Well, thank you. I mean, that those are, I mean, I think those are three big questions that a lot of entrepreneurs would have, those three main things. Uh, the, the other thing, Dan, I want to ask you about, obviously, the way we got connected was through Model Citizen Fund. Can you talk about where that got started? And the thing I love about it is the practicality of this particular charity. Right. So this is our 10-year anniversary. Um, I kept raising money for a bunch of other people's charities for years, and I wanted something that had a true cause and effect. I know I'm not going to cure cancer. I'm not going to cure AIDS. Those have been cured for decades. That's a whole different rabbit hole. And so I wanted something that could have a true cause and effect. And so we make backpacks with, filled with 150 emergency supply items inside. Half of it's food and drinks. The other half is a poncho, a watch, a sleeping bag, different things and accessories that they can use, medical kit, things, cleaning kits, et cetera, that they can actually use in their daily life. Uh, a whistle, duct tape, just things that you might not even realize, oh, socks is the number one most requested thing for the homeless. The number two most requested item is duct tape. I Socks know I and duct tape. There right? you go. I mean, and I spent five duct months. Tape fixes everything. It does, it really, man. It really does. And so my charity is very simple. It's a 0% charity. So I cover all overhead, all staff, all events, all everything forever. I'm always going to cover everything. And I also don't actually out there push to raise money for it, really. I'm always donating myself all the time. And we're able to give out millions and millions of items each year to the homeless because we create these backpacks that are very efficient. And then we'll have people in Los Angeles, San Diego, Las Vegas, go out and give it out themselves in person, or we'll ship it off to El Salvador, Tijuana. We'll send it out to orphanages, teen abuse shelters, women abuse shelters. If we're not doing homeless shelters, then we'll do those teen abuse, women abuse, and children's shelters. And so it's a very straightforward charity. That's incredible. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mentioned that before we did um, the world's largest pizza festival. A yeah. lot of people didn't realize orphanages and uh, domestic abuse shelters mm -hmm. were, were some of the places. Now, it is a backpack. Yes. That you're putting these items in. You, there's a hundred. How many items? 150. 150 items in the backpack. So when I mention the practicality, what I mean by that is the idea of like you are not giving your money to some charity that sort of, uh, sort of this uh, ethereal you, woo woo. I kind of hope the money gets to this second charity, which goes like most just, charities. Yeah, like, like most charity. This is I am getting the money. We're literally seeing the people put the water bottle and the socks in the backpack, and then the same people. I remember. I believe it was Jessica Hinton dressed up like Batman or something like that, walking around handing out these backpacks to, to homeless people like that it is real people doing this influencers with millions of followers literally giving these backpacks to the people that need it like the absolute picture of practicality and uh you know that that that's what i, I really like about it i also mostly do it so people replicate it yeah because it's so simple it is right you don't need me you don't need my backpacks you you could be in Alabama or Mississippi and you could take Ziploc bags and fill it up with supplies. You don't need a backpack, right? It's the concept that I want people to replicate. And that's why we throw so many charity events. I'm posting about charity events 
oftentimes you see people like posting the meme like don't post about charity or don't talk about charity then it's not really charity i post about charity i don't need your freaking pat in the back i post about charity because i want you to do charity yes i want you to go replicate it i want to show people that you can do this you can throw an event for a holiday toy drive thanksgiving food drive we're doing literally tomorrow yeah like you can replicate what I'm doing. I don't need you to come donate to mine. I want you to go do your own. Yeah, I, that, that's the other thing that I was going to say is like I've said this before. Like I don't care if the money comes from porn stars, drug. I don't give a shit where the money comes from. If the kids get the toys, the animal rescue gets the money for to stop the kill shelters, or if uh, you know we get money to send care packages to troops overseas, the um, uh, the orphanage gets the supplies they need, or the domestic abuse shelter gets the supplies they need. I don't, I, you can dress me, like I said before, you can dress me off like Rudolph and spank me. I don't give a shit. I, I have no shame when it comes to this stuff. If people have any problem about so what stuff I do with babies in Toyland, I don't care. Well, I, Lindsay Pala shows up, 100 grand, another 100 grand. I don't give a, I don't care. You can make fun of me all you want. The, what happened was the Midnight Mission got the toys. So I don't care about your criticism. So that's always the way I've yeah. seen it as far as that. And the other thing is these are influencers. They have a superpower. They can make people look at a thing. A lot of times the thing the thing is them in a bikini, but sometimes that thing can be this charity. And so that's why I love I love the idea of using social media in order to the, raise the, the people criticizing are donating zero dollars and zero cents. That's a that's a great <laughs> Hey, people talk shit to me about the you know, here's what people say. It's like, Oh, you bought that car you could have gave to kids. Like I do that. I do that too. Yeah, yeah. I rescued, you know, tens right. I've rescued dozens yeah. of sex slaves this year. Oh, you should have gave to your church. Hundreds of thousands of dollars there this year too, yeah. buddy. You know, yeah. but but we don't go around saying like it's not like I write a check and I'm like, hey, like a PGA. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I got this big ass check. Yeah. We're writing Nothing. it to, you know, um, this year we did the Operation Underground Railroad thing and yeah. we on Facebook we raised forty thousand dollars, right? Like from Facebook donations. Yeah. Last week on uh, Veterans Day, I was like, anybody can say Happy Veterans Day and put a picture of a flag, put some fucking money where your mouth is. I'll put a thousand bucks up into uh, Elite Meat, right, which is a Navy SEAL uh, Green Bray organization. We raised fifteen thousand dollars on Veterans Day through Facebook again. You yeah. know what I mean? Like to me, that's cool because it's not just what I give, but it's like hey, just like Dan said, it's like. I'll lead with a thousand. Can you give ten bucks? Right. You know yeah. what I mean. Like I understand you may not have as much money as me, or the ability, or be as generous as I am. Totally cool. But can you give ten? Can you give one? Can we just give fucking something? You know. Yeah. It's like yeah. getting them in the game. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Now you're a philanthropist. Exactly. You're a giver. Exactly. Let's go. Con I, hey, welcome I, to the club. I, 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 maybe not that big, but I don't know if you guys have noticed. My house is full of cats, and these are all rescues that we're going to end up in kill shelters. That's all my all the cats I have. I, my the girl she. Runs a modeling agency. She's my best friend. She has 13 cats. Oh, I probably shouldn't say that. The state's going to come after her. She has 13 cats in her house because she will not let, like, any time anyone, that, that's her thing. That's her passion, right? So for me, for Animal Rescue, I remember for my birthday, I asked everybody. I was holding this 19-pound cat that nobody wanted. That they, they, I asked the lady at the house. She's like, which one of these cats is never getting adopted? And it's like, this guy doesn't play with any other cats. Is 19 pounds. Nobody wants this cat. I was like, that's the one I want. I'll take that one. It's like, oh, you want to think about it? No. Right now, give me that cat. I took it home, and I held it up for my birthday, and I was like, guys, for my birthday i don't want you to send me anything i want you to go find the cat in the shelter that they're going to kill though you need to go to the shelter and you need to say which one of these cats is never ever getting adopted no chance missing an eye lame leg whatever that's the one i want you to adopt you do that that's what i want for my birthday that's what i asked for but i had the cat with me you know what i'm saying because that's the thing that's just something that i'm super passionate about with animal rescue there's 70 million homeless cats in this country that's something that i'm i'm passionate about so yeah i definitely definitely understand lead First, you give a thousand. Yeah. Can I ask for ten bucks? That's that's incredible. Uh, this is your life. We have somebody who's a big part. Of, actually, before we get to that, the different types of you do birthday parties, which end up being supporting the Model Citizen Fund. One was the largest pizza festival. Yeah. Your birthday party had uh, Little Wayne and Steve Aoki at it. Yeah. It was incredible. I was there. I felt like I was living in an Instagram post. It was incredible. I saw. I, I got to interview this gentleman right here. By the way, if you guys want to see those interviews, they are up uh, on Maximo TV, or you can look at this YouTube channel under interviews, and you can see my interview with Dan. Uh, that's up there and all the other people that we had D DJ Irie talked a lot about you and on, on all those people I got to interview too short, which was freaking incredible <laughs> um, But yeah, can you talk about so pajama party world's largest pizza festival the the fit the fit workout one that we yeah. did Can you talk about the different birthday parties you've had? Yes yeah, so The reason I make the influencer my birthday parties into these big events is I can get a lot of awareness for the charity And I can raise a lot of money for the charity for a couple reasons one It's an excuse to get all my rich friends to fly in because it's my birthday. Yeah, you, you got to show up, right? Uh, 
I used to throw my birthdays at Bilzerian's house every yeah. year for many years. That's those are the first parties with the. Was that the giraffe? Yeah. Okay, that yeah. was your birthday. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But we raised the money for Aoki for Aoki Foundation okay. that night for the, his brain foundation. Um, but yeah, so I would throw parties there at his house for years. Then I would throw the at Hubble Studio. We did the the fitness one yeah. where we just it's my excuse to get influencers, rich friends. It's a lot of eyeballs for the charity. I threw the world's le largest pizza festival twice. So the first time was with Tyga, Two Chains, and Wiz Khalifa as the performers. We raised a bunch of money for Model Citizen then as well. Uh, this last one with Little Wayne and Aoki raised a bunch of money for the charity as well. So I, I like to do these type of big extravaganzas because a lot of stuff happens. And how can you say no, right? Yeah, I'm, making, say no. I'm making them fun scenarios. You know you're going to meet a zillion girls there. You know you're going to see a bunch of your mutual friends there. You know it's going to be an entertaining. There's going to be big performances. Like I'm removing all of it and it's free to attend, yeah. right? It's free to, free to attend. But once you're there... Then we have people buying the fancy tables and spending money and, on bottles and donating. Like uh, They're all showing off ego-wise, donate to the charity, which was great. And so I create these scenarios in the environments, whether it's a charity poker tournament or a pizza festival, I create these environments where people want to donate. Yeah. Right. I'm making it easy for them to donate. Right. There's people walking around with iPads, so you can just, boom, donate right there on, your, on the credit card. You can text this number. You can go to the website. And so we're able to raise six figures for charities every single time. The charity overhead is covered. I'm spending $800,000 on a birthday party. Yeah, that's right. Not a penny comes from the charity because yeah. we don't raise that much, obviously. I'm spending six figures on these events because I want to put up a, a scenario and a setting for the charity to get more famous, for all these people to meet each other, and then six figures usually gets raised for each yeah. charity. That's incredible, man. Yeah, and everybody was there. Like every again, it is like you go through, you slide through, and you your your Instagram, and you see all these Instagram models that you see. And then you go to Dan's charity event and every single, every single one of them is there. It is incredible. So when, when I was leaving the party, um, there was this Lindsay Pellis. Yeah. Right? So I, I, she was there at the party and I did, first oh, seen did, her with you. Did you see the interview she did with me where she kicks me off the, the thing and takes my microphone? No. I'll, I'll send it to you. It's and, pretty funny. And so I, I had seen her in some of Dan's posts years back, yeah. right? Uh, Bill Zarian's post, right? And so she's kind of a famous model or whatever. And I knew Irie because we were in Miami partying uh, a few months prior. Well, I was the, my wife, everybody was cramming on those buses out of there. And yeah. my wife and I just stayed to the end. We're like, we'll wait. We're in no hurry. We got our own jet. We can leave whenever. We just wait, right? So we got on the very last bus out of that house. And Lindsay was on there and Irie was on there. And there was this like Russian or Dutch or I don't know, some, some like, really thick accent young lady that was on there with her boyfriend. I think they were Polish. And and by the way, Polish accent is like the Alabama accent of Europe. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll leave it at that. So they're they're very Polish people. And she goes, oh, look, there is a, uh, a microphone. I wonder if anybody can sing karaoke. And we're like, fuck, man, it's like one in the morning. You know what I mean? Yes. I, I came from Dallas, so I'm flying back to Dallas. So it's really three in the morning for me. And she has the worst voice right. in the world. And she's singing at one in the morning, trying to get Irie to sign her or some shit. He's drunk or high or something. And he's like, keep going, shouty. Like, try to get her. Then Lindsay and, and her friend are sitting over there. And after about five songs, like, Ryan Steumann comes out. Like, I haven't had enough. It's like, listen, you got to shut the fuck up and sit down. I've had enough. Right? Like, it's funny the first three songs. And, and I, I never talked to this Lindsay chick. I never, I'd only seen her in yeah. real life once at, yeah. at that party. And she turned around and she's like, it's a real asshole thing to do. And I was like, yeah. how are you going to, I know that I'm not the only person. Like my friend, Jesse Lee was sitting in front of me. And as soon as that chick started singing, she goes, I just bought these new iPads. We're about to test these noise canceling features. Fuck y'all. <laughs> and like put them in. She yeah. was the only happy person on the bus. Lindsay was? No, my friend, Jesse oh, Lee that had the, the noise canceling. But Lindsay turned around. She's like, you're being an asshole. That's unnecessary. It's like, she won't stop. Like we, it was, it was fun novelty. One or two songs, five into it. It's one in the fucking morning. Hilarious. We got 30 more minutes of LA traffic to fight here. <laughs> that is hilarious, man. Yeah, that's very uh that's so it's, very so it's fun to hear the different versions of how people experience my events. I, I am going I'm going to ask Lindsay because she's coming on obviously and I'm gonna ask her about that. She has to remember that she has to like, remember that situation. You know she's from Baton Rouge. No. Yeah she's from Baton Rouge. I don't right. know a lot about her. I yeah. just there's obvious reasons to notice her and I noticed her over yeah. there, you know and and uh it's like oh that's the damn Bilzerian girl that, that yeah. he dated for a while and yeah. And the first time she says something, she's like, that was a very asshole thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's incredible. All right. So um, speaking of uh, Lindsay Perlis, you know what, who her best friend is, right? It's Emily Sears, and we have a question from Emily Sears, who right. is a big supporter of Model Citizen Fund. Uh, she, Emily Sears asks, it, it, okay, if you're, what is your favorite bear out of a polar bear, a grizzly, and a panda? That's what, she, that's what Emily wants to know. It's definitely a panda. Your, your yeah. panda yeah. is a reason? They're super cute. Okay. And they look like they're like wearing a suit and tie. I just think it's great. Okay. All right. Well, shout out to Emily. And I, I, I will have Lindsay. We're going to definitely ask her that question about that. Tatiana Erickson wants to know, if you could be doing anything else, uh, what would you be doing? Or if you could start over, what would you what would you do? What would you do different? Uh, sign contracts with everyone, including your mom. Okay. Everyone. Just sign contracts. And it's not that you're ever going to sue your mom, right? Yeah. It's by signing a contract, by signning a... Oh, your mom. I did my yeah. mom. I was yeah. like, my Maria Sartain yeah. is like confused right now. Okay. The, the concept is, it's, it's like a memorandum of understanding. Yes. You know, a one pager that just says, Ryan's going to do this. Expectations. I'm going to do this. And this is what's going to happen. Because most relationships break up over miscommunication. That is true. Boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives, business partners, friends, bosses, etc., co-workers they get mad at each other because i expected ryan to, to do this right ryan's like hey we're gonna go sell these we're gonna go sell these microphones cool and i think he means we're gonna sell microphones online and he thinks we're actually gonna sell re microphones to stores retail brick and, and mortar, so for yeah. the last two weeks he's been knocking on doors all over las vegas selling microphones and i've been at home trying to get like cold traffic onto a website and he's like what are you doing like he's mad at me and i'm mad at him like and that could have been really clear if he just said, I'm going to handle the door-to-door -door sales and you're going to handle the e-commerce. And so when I say sign contracts with everyone, there's just so many situations that lead to breakups and headaches and lawsuits and people talking crap about each other because there wasn't basic communication. And so be blunt with people. Explain what you want. A closed mouth doesn't get fed. Beautiful. Have you read uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willick? Mm -hmm. He talks about, uh, he talks about uh, communication is the responsibility of the sender. That's what I do. Like I expect, I talk to really smart people. I always think I'm talking to a six-year-old with ADD. No yep. matter what, I try to break things down as the most simple way possible and will continue to say it until they say it back to me and they understand what I'm saying. But yeah, that is absolutely, that is, that's definitely a great thing. Way, then, uh, the people that are asking you the questions, I like Tatiana, Emily, Lindsay, these yeah. people are like, they are such hustlers. They are yes. so consistently working, modeling, going to events, creating social media content, working with brands, networking, like, Th these three girls in particular, I know because out of the thousands of girls that I work with, they, they have been so consistent. Like day after day, day after day, they're in a job that's got bombardment of crazy guys and crazy brands and crazy situations. And they have stuck through everything and built up these millions of followers. And just for the three of them in particular, I've watched them grow and it's amazing to see. It is. It is. Those, those, I'm big fans of those three specifically. Um, your wife, Casey, yep. how'd you meet her? She, I, I've always been, she's been so nice to me. She was, um, uh, there were several things I can't remember I was asking her for, and she always had to answer r real quick response, and she's a really, really awesome girl. Can you talk about where you met Casey, how did this whole thing develop, and you know why her? Why, why is the connection so strong with her? Sure. So she originally pitched me on a bikini brand, Okay. and I pitched her on life. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, that's the fast-forward version. But she had a bikini brand, and during the meeting, I asked her, I said, do you care about the bikini brand, or do you care about fitness? Because you keep bringing up personal training. You keep care about, You talk about fitness so much, and so I want you to go home and do a little homework choose whether you're going to go all in on bikinis or you're going to go all on fitness. And she looked at me like I was a jerk. And uh, our first meeting had nothing to do with us hooking up, obviously. Like, that wasn't even crossing my mind. And I just was like in awe of this girl because I liked her thought process. And you're right. Um, right. And so I actually called my best friend, uh, who was the founder of Marvel Studios. So he created Iron Man and all these great movies. And I told him one hour after meeting her, I'm going to marry this girl. Really? I've never said that in my life. I always think it's crap when people talk about it, but I have verification from a guy that's never going to lie, multi-billionaire. I told him within one hour meeting, I'm going to marry this Do you girl. hear that, Casey? You hear that? She's that's her, what she, she said. She knows the story. Okay. Uh, and I said that because I was, I was just blown away. Yeah. Every, like, I feel like I drew her when I was a child, like when I was in high school. Like, I feel like I drew her. And so watching, like, the way she is and the way we are, and I live a very crazy lifestyle traveling around the planet. And... <sighs> Finding someone that's so wholesome and focused on training and our dogs and her business and like, it's just she was it. Was it? So you're around a lot of influencers, All right? Of so so yeah. physical attractiveness is not always going to affect you as much. I, I found that that the case. Yeah. Did she ever have the objection of like why there's all these other girls around? Why why do you feel this way? Or did she just know also? I think she knows that I'm numb to it because okay. I've been around girls for my my whole life. Yeah, um, working with models since 
before social media existed. Right. I've become numb to it. And I've always been like a serial dater. Like I've been in always two to five year relationships. Wow. Okay. Um, and so it's never been a thing for me to like gallivant around because I'm a quiet guy. So I'm yeah. not going to go hit on a girl at a club. It's never happened. I, like it's never going to happen. Right. But I've always dated these girls for two to five years that anyways. So it worked out that she's, she's understanding of my lifestyle and everything yeah. I'm around. And she's never looked at my phone or cared or deal, asked me about girls or models. Cause one, I'm too public anyway, so I can't of course. do anything anyways. Uh, but two, it just never even crossed her mind. It's of course. Not- that's beautiful, man. That's awesome. And I always, I always, that's one of the things I ask everyone who is in this sphere, who has a, has a healthy relationship. I always ask because it's fucking hard to do that in this sphere, sure. right? You never know. I've, I've absolutely had girls uh, come try to be with me for connections they think I have or something that I can do for them. And it's, it's it, things that are not genuine and you just never know. So like that, that's incredible that, you know, you find that. There's a couple of key things that people are not blunt about. Mm-hmm. One, be blunt about your intentions. Okay. Two, be blunt about like, you're not going to hide anything from them. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. You're, when you're with someone, you live with someone, especially, or you're married to someone, you're not going to hide anything. No matter how slick you think you are, you are not going to hide anything. Next is be clear with the people that are hitting you up. So if there's people that are out there that are hitting you up, be clear with them too, because people talk and there's a lot of rumors and gossip, but also remove any fears from your significant other's mind. Okay. Because if you just allow them or you think it's cool or like strong or you flex or you get an argument, and you're like, yeah, well, I got all these girls or I got all these guys like that's going to be burned in their brain the rest of your relationship. Right. And so removing fears from people is really important. Uh, being blunt about communication is really important. And setting clear goals and guidelines and like uh, around you is super, super yeah. important. Uh, including them in a lot of the stuff. When you're doing some of these influencer events, Casey's there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that that definitely makes a big difference. That's awesome, man. And anytime I, like I said, anytime I hear about anybody having a healthy relationship in this sphere, I always want to know as much as I can about it. That's incredible. Um, this is another story, man, about James Morris and the the heart attack. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's a very unique story that I heard once. Yeah. So it had been a couple of years of like trying to raise capital, and originally we were going to go. What, what, what year is this? This is a while back, this right? a long time ago. Okay. It's got to be 15 plus years ago. Okay. So we were working with the CEO. He had like, he was the CEO of Jordash and CEO of Calvin Klein. And he had just bought FUBU, the ladies division. And we had this crazy deal with Sean John Underwear and Kevin Garnett and DMX. We bought the license to Rough Riders. Like I'm like in my early twenties and I have all these brands underneath me and I'm the largest shareholder with these guys. And so it was a crazy time. There's, we're getting orders for millions and millions and millions of dollars with every major chain store, all these different brands. And there's these guys that wanted to raise money for us to like take us public the first time before we we're actually going to go public. And I go into this meeting and James Morris with this guy is 74 years old, but he like travels around on yachts and he's got all like the 23 year old girls. And he was like the zillionaire of all zillionaires. And he was like the legend in the public, public company space. And so he was like my grandfather figure to me. And like, I used to get advice from him. And so we're in this meeting and uh, there's another guy that's kind of the one that's supposed to basically be the one to write the check, right? He's the one that's going to invest in us. So we go to this office. It's in Malibu. It's right there where the, it's actually in the old Red Bull office in the corner of Malibu on sunset. And so we're sitting in the meeting and I'm literally going to get a check for millions of dollars. That moment, this is two years in the making. This is the moment. And it's me, my business partner, and James. He's writing out the check, okay? And when I say the exact same moment, I mean the exact same moment, James has a full-fledged heart attack. Have you ever heard this story? Really? I don't really talk about it. He has a full-fledged heart attack and, and falls down. And we think it's a joke. Oh, my God. Because when I say like he's literally writing the check at the same moment, we'd been in a two-hour meeting. So it wasn't like it was two years and then two hours into it when the check is happening. So it sincerely felt like a joke because he is healthy, happy-go-lucky. He, when I say he's on yachts and Ibiza, I'm saying he's on, having fun on yachts and Ibiza yeah. in the 70s. Like he was the legend. He falls over and he's not, but he's also not passed. He didn't pass away. So he didn't just die. And we, we think it's a joke. So we're trying to resuscitate him. They, they realize it's not a joke. We call the ambulance. And then uh, the next day he passes away. That's, inc- that's crazy. Whole deal falls apart, by the way. 
because it's all over, hanging over our head. That guy does not invest into us. And there's this weird like two year gap of like, so I must've been 21 at the time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. That's so unbelievable, man. Wow. What That's a crazy, crazy story, man. That's amazing. Um, all right. So listen, listen I, I know you guys got Thrive and all this other stuff. So I'm going to wrap it up. We got one more question here. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you know, for, for both of you, how do you know when you're talking to somebody and they're worth your time? Do you understand? The, do you understand the question I'm asking? Like, for instance, you know, I, I did a bunch of your charity events. I love hosting the carpet. I tell as many people. I brought probably sixty girls to your last yep. one uh, because I think you're obviously worth everyone's time to me. And I, I wanted to show you, I, you know, I was worth your time. How do you guys know when you're sitting there, you're talking to clients or possible investor, a possible sponsor, or a possible mentor? How do you guys know when somebody's worth your time? Well, you know, someone's worth your time if they're worth more than you. So let's say that uh, Dan is worth a lot more money than I am, and um, and I don't know him, right? But I but I know that he's a man of opulence and a man of stature and value, so that it would be worth my time to maybe learn something from him or align with him and his network. Then there's the person that is on the same level as you that is worth your time because they are – arrived at the same level you're at, probably taking a different path so you can take and trade uh, ideas and stuff like that. And it's somebody that's successful on your level, whatever level that is for you out there. Then the hard part is someone who's below you. How do you pick those people out, right? Um, first of all, it's I don't like charity cases, and, and I know you guys talk about charity, but I don't want it does me no good to help somebody that really can't or doesn't want to help themselves in, in this case, right? Like if I'm gonna give them a backpack and they're homeless, that's fine. But in, in the, to spend my time with them, that doesn't do them any good. So I'm looking for somebody who has potential. And really what I'm looking for is the old Ryan. I'm looking for, if it's someone that's below me, I'm looking for that, that lady at the car wash that recognized my talent that said, you work your ass off. I'd like to give you a job. I want to be that for as many people as possible, but I also know what that spark looks like. I also know if they're just if they're only working and wiping off tables when I'm around or if they're like that all the time. You know what I mean? So um, I think that's really how I judge who's worth my time. It's like what, what level are they on? They're on those three levels. They're with me, above me, or below me. And what is going to be the benefit to them and me if I spend my time on them? Got so. it. Got it. What about you? And also, you have invested in a lot of poker players, too. Some people who y you see something in. How, how do you find figure out somebody that's worth your time? So the people that are worth my time are either experts or they're movers and shakers. Okay. And so someone that's a mover and shaker, I know that if I do something with them, they're actually going to take the action to go do it. Or if they're an expert, I can learn from them about a certain niche. And that expert could be literally about how to make wood tables. I'm never going to make wood tables, but I can learn about them. If yeah. they're going to make wood tables really well, I'm going to invest into them or introduce them to Ryan, and maybe we're going to invest into this wood table manufacturer. So I'm looking for someone that is an expert in a space, in a niche or a category. That's interesting to me, no matter what size they are. They could be broken homeless, but if they know how to make wood tables really well, that's interesting to me from a time perspective. And movers and shakers are interesting to me because they might not be doing the thing that they're going to do for me or with me. They might be a mover and shaker that knows how to sell wooden tables really well. Yeah. But uh, hey, if, what if I introduce you to Ryan, you go sell his packages and you start making 200 grand a year selling stuff for Ryan Stuman. You used to sell four grand a month of tables. Now you make 200K working for him. So people that take action are really interesting to me um, because I know I can place them with one of my friends or one yeah. of my companies. I've done investments in 37 companies personally, 10 of them through my rolling fund. And I look for companies and people I call quarterbacks. Yeah. Someone yeah. that I know if they're a mover and shaker, they can actually lead people. That's the next level. They can actually lead people. Pff, I want to keep them as close to me as possible because there's just not that many of them. That's incredible. So you have a bunch of motivated people, capable people around you. And I think probably Ryan would agree. You're probably the best connector any of us knows. Right. I mean, that that is an elite level of ability to connect people. We just you, had this conversation yeah. on Facebook a couple of days ago. Yeah. Because I do it with intention. Yes. And. A lot of it I do because I know I can cut through all the crap. I'm not going to introduce Ryan to the random guy, right? If someone's like, hey, I want to meet Ryan, and they're just like the random guy, I'm not going to. I get 40 of those, and Ryan never hears about it because I don't bother him about it. Yeah. But then the guy's like, hey, I want to invest into buying real estate in Dallas. Okay, Ryan wants to hear about it. Hey, I want to. I need coaching. I need someone that can. I need. A, I need someone I can pay 50k or 100k to really dive deep. Oh, you should talk to Ryan. I'm never going to introduce him to the person that's useless to him. Yeah. For both people's sake, I know that person's not going to take action. I know Ryan's not going to want to bother with it. And because I only do it sometimes, because I only do some introductions, it also, I'm not the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so 
the billionaire friends, the zillionaire friends, the celebrities, everybody every day asks me to introduce them to Bilzerian and Aoki. Maybe once in a year or two do I ever do it. Once in a year, out of hundreds yeah. of requests, once in a year or two I do it. Because everybody it's wants to be those guys' friends. Right? <laughs> and you you want to know what the, the trick is? I'll tell, people want to know. Uh, so, Dan brought Aoki to my birthday party uh, a couple weeks ago. And the thing with Dan is that, like, I, I, like I, I cannot imagine what it's like being Bulzarian. It's like crazy that because I've been out with him so many times and it's just like the pe way people react. People were throwing water on us from the balcony at my birthday. It was insane. He had security guards. The whole thing was crazy. But the thing is with Dan is like I never would so, was like, hey, Dan, can you get me on the list of the Ignite party? My message was all, Dan, I got 70 girls. I need to take them somewhere. Where should I take them? He's like, put them on this list. Yeah. And he was happy to see me because that's how I am with him. I never want him to think, bro, I need your girls, your money. I've never asked this dude for money like that, like a genuine friendship. right? I respect this dude because he was in the Navy and he's like a really smart guy. And the same thing with, with you. This, it, it, I've never come to you ask for money. I ask for the opportunity to help promote a charity that you have that I right. think is freaking awesome. You know what I'm saying? And, and my man Ryan here, who's from the greatest city in the entire world, I agree. Go Cowboys. And, uh, you know, that that's the, I love helping these people. And I don't need to ask for anything in return. If you guys want to know how do you meet Bulzarian and how you meet Aoki, that's how you do it. I agree. That's With how anybody. you do it. That's yeah. how you do. You go, you go balls to the wall helping the thing they they want help with, the charity or whatever. I didn't come to you and be like, hey man, I have an idea. Can you can you give me a VC thing? I'm like, hey man, what can I do to help your charity? Yeah. Right. So the guys like let's say an Ed Milet or someone that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, what are you gonna do? Buy him a watch? Right. What are you gonna do? Buy him something? What do they that's irrelevant? But they can't buy cool. Yeah. They can't buy experiences. And so the reason I throw so many charity events, if I ask Ed, for example, to come to my charity event. He wants to go emotionally because it's something fun for him and it's a nice gesture. If I throw a big business event, I'm like, hey, Ed, you're going to be the keynote speaker in Dallas, Texas or Salt Lake City or here in Las Vegas. He wants to do that because it's right. So by creating that experience, now that I have that, now I get to invite all the other friends that also want to meet Ed. They also want to meet each other. And so now the, the audience, let's call it Thrive, there's 800 people in the audience. They want to meet Ryan Stuman, Aaron Wagner, Cole Hatter, Ed Milet, Andy Fursella, et cetera. Every level wants to meet each other, right? But it's all like the high school dance. What I'm doing is I'm just taking the dance and putting the hands together. Right. Like literally with Justin Bilzerian, we were at the Palms. They used to do a skating thing outside the nightclub there. I physically put their hands together. You're talking about Ju uh, Justin Bieber? No, Jessa Hinton. And oh, Jessa, Jessa, yeah. I, Jessa, okay. I get, it's like a fun random story, but like yeah. I physically put their hands together. It's, that's what I do every day in situations where when I have events, People want to meet each other. Yeah. And so I throw charity events. I throw entrepreneur events. I throw high level events. And through that process, lots of people are meeting with each other. They want to network with each other. And so oftentimes the networking that I'm doing, some of it's intentional, like I'm hand, like hand to hand combat, yeah. like introducing them. And other times it's just, I'm creating the environment for what everybody wants from this level to this level. It's all the way up here. Do you ever notice when you're talking to somebody who's very successful and you know, there's somebody they should know and you're like, you know, so-and-so and they're like, no, you're like, how is that possible? How do you yeah. not know this? This happens all, frequently, all the time. Frequently with you, Dan. I'm like, yeah. wait, wait, you're into crypto. You live in Los Angeles. You do a bunch of charity events. You don't know Dan Fleischman. How the f how the fuck is that possible? Right. You know, and then I'll. Uh, it's just a math game. Yeah. I'm not famous. Yeah. I'm famous within circles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If I walk into Thrive, I, I can't go five feet. Yeah. But if I walk down Las Vegas Boulevard, nobody's going to know who the hell I am. Yeah, exactly. That's, there's no ego to that. It's just, it's math in reality. And so. To me, I have no ego to it. When people say they don't know who I am, why, why should you know who I am? Right. There's 7 billion humans. I'm not anywhere yeah. near that, right? And so what happens is oftentimes the high school prom situation happens where this billionaire wants to meet that billionaire and they've never met. I immediately group chat them They're right there on the spot. Okay. Right there on the spot. I've done that too. Yeah, that's Because that's I, they want to know each other, but the, she's not going to ask him and he's not going to ask her, just yeah. like at the high school dance. Beautiful. All right, man. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Is there anything else? Uh, first off, where can we find you, Ryan? Uh, everywhere. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, anywhere with a blue check, Hardcore Closer or Ryan Stuman. But the only the accounts with blue checks, all that other shit is uh, fake people. Or you can go to my website, HardcoreCloser.com. And uh, shameless plug, check out PhoneSites.com if you're looking for a website, too. So, And, and if I'm looking for a certain type of thing. Why am I? Well, I'm going for Hardcore Closer for what type of business exactly? Uh, um, any kind of business. If you look for sales, marketing, mindset, more, that kind of stuff. Okay, so beautiful. And Articles, then, videos. And, and then you have a daily podcast. Uh, yeah, it's called Rewired. Rewired Podcast. Yeah, it's five yes. minutes a day. Uh, we've got shit, uh, almost a thousand episodes at this point. Yeah. Maybe more are. than a thousand episodes. Yeah, that's incredible. Awesome. Well, where, where can we find you? Mine's just at Dan Fleischman on everything. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And the, the thing is, 
you are one of the most successful people that it's hardest for me to explain what you do. Do you understand that? Like it is like for a lot of times I'm like, what is Dan Fleischman doing? I'm like, the thing, the main thing I say is he can, the, the successful people I know in Los Angeles know all, he, all know each other through Dan. Yeah. That's probably the best way to explain it. Okay. okay. Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate it. You guys come in, man. I, I, I'm never, never going to take you guys for granted. You didn't have to come out here and I really appreciate you guys coming out here during Thrive. Uh, if you guys like this episode, please like, please share, please subscribe, man. I, I can't tell you enough how much um, these next couple weeks. I'm very interested to see what you think about. Obviously, we had a theoretical physicist on. We got a couple of flat earthers coming on. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you guys both believe the earth is round. <laughs> Thank God. Um, the, uh, you, we, we have uh, the foremost uh, professor in the world on evolutionary psychology, Dr. David Buss, is going to come on. Um, and we have just a, an amazing group. of uh, Jessa, Jessa Rhodes, the porn star, she's coming on. We have an incredible group of people that are coming on. So I want to say thank you all. Thank you for sh your suggestions. I'm going to lead this, uh, this. This podcast is about gratitude, and it's about intellectual curiosity. And thank you guys for letting me do the thing that I love and having this thing triple the, in, uh, in views in the last couple of weeks. So I really, really appreciate that. And I will see you all next week. Oof. Oof.